it all. I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to push the little button. You will hear something that says this is being. There you go. And that means, right. my friends, you are good to go. Do I have to hit continue? You, uh, yes. Well, yes, yes, most certainly. Okay. Make sure right. that you accept being recorded. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Connolly, the chair of the Situate Select Board. Um, in response to Governor Baker's declaration of a public health emergency and the related emergency executive order dated March 12th, 2020, Town of Situate public meetings shall meet remotely until further notice. This meeting will be recorded and can be viewed live on Situate Community Television Facebook Live. The recorded meeting will be available the following day on Comcast Channel 9 and YouTube Situate Community Television. You can join this meeting tonight via Zoom. By computer, use a link. Um, and if you would like to go to the town webpage, you can click on the calendar and it will bring you to the agenda, which will give you the Zoom uh, link to click. To ask a question once or comment once the meeting has started, click the icon labeled participants at the bottom of your center of your computer. At the bottom of the participant list on the right side of the screen, click the button labeled raise hand to ask a question during the Q&A period. Uh, should I read the by phone instructions? By phone, you can dial 1-301-715-8592, enter meeting ID 868-007-2311. When prompted for participant ID number, press hashtag, enter passcode 019-2332. To ask a question or comment using your phone's keypad, push nine to raise hand during the Q&A period. Um, do I hear a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. So moved by Ms. Canfield. Second by Ms. Curran. Uh, this requires a roll call vote. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignelli. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Um, right now, I will um, see if there are any walk-ins. I don't see any hands raised. All right, seeing no walk-ins, um, if we can have the report of the town administrator, Mr. Boudreau. Well, good evening. Let's uh, start with the topic that's on everybody's mind, Boo Boo the Bear. Uh, Boo Boo the Bear was last spotted in situ yesterday, uh, yesterday morning in the neighborhood of the golf course. Uh, this morning it was sighted in Cohasset. It seems to be heading towards Wampatuck State Park, so Boo Boo is gone. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for it, but we think it's heading towards a more suitable habitat where it has more room to roam. Maybe it'll stay in Wampatuck, maybe it'll wander, uh, but right now it has left situ. If it comes back, if you do see it, please let us know, call the police. Uh, and follow the instructions that were posted on how to deal with it. But basically stay away from it and let us know and we'll, we'll come uh, come get it and, and move it along. But Boo Boo's gone, so uh, <laughs> our shot of fame for that is, has ended. Um, water is probably the next biggest topic that we've been talking about. Um, repairs were completed on well 19 on Friday. Uh, we get the well back online. We get the testing back from DEP that's required. Uh, we let the well run overnight to fill up the water tanks, make sure everything was okay. And then we released the emergency water ban on Saturday, uh, just so the board can get an idea. Um, Wednesday the 26th, before Memorial Day, the usage was 2.657 million gallons for that day. That's 4th of July type usage for us. We'd never see those numbers. It was equal to the highest day pump in the last four years. Uh, for the Memorial Day weekend, after the imposition of the water ban and we had a rainy weekend, uh, the average demand was 1.683 million gallons a day. For last week during the weekday, it dropped down to 1.375 million gallons per day, uh, about a million four, million three less than that high on Wednesday. On Friday, it was 1.4 million gallons. We released the water ban around midday on Saturday. Saturday was 1.8 million gallons, and Sunday was 2.1 million gallons in change. So you can see the dramatic swings that we get in our usage, and it's really based on outside use. It's, it's not people bathing, it's not cooking, it's not taking care of things. It's outside use for watering lawns, washing cars, washing boats, 
And it really shows how much water we can save when people decide to conserve water. And we went down 1.3 million gallons per day from Wednesday to Wednesday. That's amazing. So uh, we need to keep conserving. Right now we have water. The reservoir is spilling over, uh, but we do need to keep conserving. A reminder that we are in our regular water restrictions that are imposed by the state. You go to the town website, situatema.gov, DPW and water department and find those restrictions. Uh, but we do ask you to continue to conserve water. It looks like it's gonna be a hot summer. So every, uh, everything we can conserve now is water that we'll have for later. Uh, as most people are aware, the state has fully lifted the COVID uh, restrictions. A fully vaccinated individuals no longer are required or need to wear a mask indoors or outdoors, except as provided. Non-vaccinated individuals, it is recommended that you still wear a mask. However, it is not mandatory. Face coverings will still be mandatory for all individuals on public and private transportation settings, ride shares, livery, taxes, and at the airport, the MBTA, commuter rail stations, and in healthcare settings. Uh, masks will be required indoors for staff and students without K through and early education as required by the state. Uh, businesses, people need to know that businesses have the right to impose their own mask requirements, regardless of the state's guidance. So you may go to a particular business where they will ask that you continue to wear a mask. So you should probably still have one with you just in case. Uh, but for right now, the, most of the restrictions from COVID are lifted. In addition to that, the governor's emergency declaration will expire on June 15th. That has one implication for us right out of the bat. And that is the remote meetings are allowed under the emergency declaration. Uh, if the legislature does not pass legislation that the governor has filed to allow us to continue that, then starting on the 16th of June, all meetings will have to return to in-person meetings and there will be no more remote participation. Under our remote participation guidelines, uh, it is very limited as to what boards and committees can do remotely. And we do not allow remote participation currently under our guidelines by residents. So if we wanna continue that, we'll have to change it. I did speak to Senator O'Connor today. He expects the legislation extending remote meetings uh, to pass early next week, and that will extend remote meetings until April of 2022. Uh, one thing that we have to work on, Seth and I discussed it, originally the governor's date for reopening the economy and lifting the emergency order was August 1st. So Seth was aiming for August 1st to have all the stuff necessary to allow the boards to meet yet still have remote participation in the meeting room. Uh, the change to May 29th kind of put a wrench in that. So we're scrambling a little bit, uh, but he's working on that. We'll get it done as quickly as possible, but it's not that we didn't anticipate it. It's just the governor changed the date at us at the last minute. And now we're having a hard time getting the materials to get them in and make that happen. Well, we'll make it happen. Uh, we hope the legislation passes next week and that will be a determination by this board, whether or not you want to continue meeting remotely, uh, meeting in person or allowing remote participation by residents. But the first key is to get that legislation passed uh, before the 15th. And again, Senator O'Connor was fairly confident that that will pass as well as the extension of the outdoor dining. Uh, that is not as pressing because that has a 60 day expiration after the 15th, but they are expected to pass that also. Uh, I think the only thing really from my discussions with him that does not look like it might be extended uh, would be the provision for to-go cocktails. Uh, there seem to be some issues in cities about to-go cocktails and delivery. Uh, so that might not pass, but most of the other executive orders that the governor passed uh, look like they'll be extended by the legislature. Everybody 12 and over is now eligible for vaccinations. You can go to the Marshfield Fairground uh, without an appointment now and get a vaccination. Just a reminder, 12 to 17 year olds can only get the Pfizer shot. The Marshfield Fairgrounds does both. Uh, so you just have to make sure you go in or book your appointment for a day. That's doing the Pfizer if you're taking 12 to 17 year olds. Uh, as of yesterday, from our previous update of two weeks ago, we had five new cases, uh, one last week and four from the previous week. We are still in the gray with a 0.53 positivity rating. So our numbers are excellent. The mirror of the states, the states are also 0.53. Uh, so we're in good shape. Our neighboring towns are in good shape. We're seeing our vaccination numbers look good. So let's just keep it up. And hopefully everybody will have a nice, safe summer when it comes to uh, the vaccine. But the numbers do look good. Uh, the Peggy Beach parking lot is ongoing. You'll see that we've put down the base coat. We've also put down temporary striping in the parking lot. Uh, we still need to do the top coat. Uh, right now, we have put the top coat off. Obviously, we don't want to close the parking lot to pave when it's this hot. 
So we have put that off. We'll continue to kind of monitor it. If we get too far into the beach season, we'll just put the paving off until the fall and do the final coat in the fall. But we will try to get it done uh, before the end of the year so we can make all the final cleanups on Peggotty Beach. So stay tuned. If it looks like we have a couple of cool days and we can get the contract, we will finish paving down at, at Peggotty Beach. Uh, Cole Parkway Marina was wrapped up with the exception of the Overlook. We're just waiting for railings to come in. That will be done. Cedar Point is wrapped up with the exception of the final paving. We will do that in the fall. The contractor is gone. We will let those trenches settle over the summer and then come back uh, in the fall to do the final paving. Uh, I know it's getting late, but if people are hot and they want to cool off, you can go to the Council on Aging tonight till 7.30. We did leave that open a little bit longer tonight uh, for people to cool off. I know we had uh, some people there yesterday. Uh, it was very busy. I think part of it was programming and part of it was people looking to get cool. But we will keep that open until 7.30 tonight. Uh, the heat's supposed to start breaking tomorrow a little bit and then finally get cooler on Thursday. Uh, last thing I have tonight, even though she doesn't watch, I want to wish my wife a happy anniversary. Uh, 19 years. I don't know how she puts up with me, but uh, next year I cannot have a meeting on my anniversary because it's 20 years, but she, she gave me 19. So uh, happy anniversary to Kate. That's it. Happy anniversary. That's good. Happy news. anniversary, Jim. Thank you. And Kathleen. Uh, does the board have any questions for Jim? I, don't I just have one comment. Jim, can you just uh, comment about the library and explain why that's not open as a cooling center yet? I mean, the library is open. We're not doing it as a particular cooling center, but it is open. It is still open. Uh, some of the restricted hours, we're at about two thirds of our regular hours. Uh, the reason for that is we have three vacancies in the staff right now. We just filled those vacancies. And those people will be starting kind of in a staggered uh, schedule over the next couple of days. So in order to get the library fully staffed and back up and running, uh, we will not be fully opening the library until June 15th, at which point we'll open regular schedule for the rest of the summer. Uh, but really for them, it was a staffing issue as opposed to not wanting to open the library. Thank you. But it is open. If people want to go there and, and get cool, you are allowed to go in. You're allowed to hang out and, and do your library stuff at this point. Any other questions? Andrew? Uh, just a quick question. Was there some... Uh, work being done or something with some roofing at Old Gates yesterday that I saw some folks up there and had a question about if uh, uh, any work's being done over there or what might be happening. Just on on the gates of the gym, Andrew. The gym, the gym area. The I'm gym not area. aware of any work going on. The gym roof, uh, repairs to the roof was part of the project. Um, okay. So they might just be up there making sure it's right. Or they might have had a leak spring in some of the work. So, uh, but Repairs to that roof was part of the gym project. So that could be what's going on. Great, just curious. Great, thank you. And I have one question about um, water usage at the marinas. Um, are they at a one day schedule? Are they on a precinct schedule? Are they on a, is anyone monitoring the use not only at the private marinas, but the town marina? There are, I mean, each marina has its own, obviously its own meter. Uh, we do meter the water right. that we use at our, uh, marina there is no odd day off day they're allowed to wash their boats right now uh, actually we had a conversation i know with the water department this morning uh, one of the things i've asked them to provide for me is the amount of water usage that we are using at the marinas uh, to get an idea of what that looks like in terms of water usage vis-a-vis -vis watering lawns and washing cars and stuff so but they are allowed to wash their boats at the marinas well it takes a lot of water to wash a boat depending on the size of course but um if we yep. could and last year, out. last year we put a, the full water ban on, and we stopped people from watering their boats. So right, I, under, boats. I understand, but currently they can water their boats now, anytime, any day. Right. Correct. Yep. So maybe there's some sort of a, a fix there that can be done. Just suggesting it. Um, I mean, I think there's a there's a bunch of things we have to talk about in terms of water. So if you have a uh, irrigation system, you are on a water schedule. If you go set up five or six sprinklers and connect them to hoses, you're not on a water schedule. Uh, Kevin and I were talking about that today. That, that yeah. doesn't seem rational that you can do that. So I think there's some some tweaks we need to make. We also met with uh, Becky Melma today to start, start talking about um, the water offset program and getting that up and running. So I think there's some more things we need to talk to in terms of water conservation and, and how we measure that. But yeah, it's part of the conversation. Okay, thank you. Anybody else, anyone from uh, the audience? 
We don't see anyone. All right, um, on to the next scheduled item. It's 6.50, I, are we ahead of schedule? Oh, two minutes, but these are public hearings, so I think we can uh, vote them. Yes, Jim? Licenses? Yes, yeah, you can go okay. ahead. Okay, go I, ahead. Just, I just wanna make sure, thank you. Um, first of all, we have halfway to St. Patrick's Day. Uh, their application is for a special events and one day license. I think Mr. Kelly is here. Mr. Kelly speak? is here. Mr. Kelly yes. can unmute himself and start his video if he wishes. And Mr. Kelly, if you would identify yourself and your address, please, for the record. Ed Kelly, 44 Holly Road. Thank you. Would you like to tell us about halfway to St. Patrick's Day? All right, well, we're contemplating doing the parade as a halfway to St. Patrick's Day parade. Um, we're applying for the permit from the town first so that I don't waste my time contacting everybody and setting it all up and then finding out later that we're not gonna be able to do it. So it's not a uh, written in stone at the present time. Um, I don't know um, if everybody's gonna be on board at this point. Uh, if we get approval, then we'll go and I'll start uh, the procedures to put it together and I'll know in short order whether we're gonna be able to put it together or not, so. Okay. Does the board have any questions? No, uh, okay. Karen Canfield. I'll just note, Mr. Kelly has, how many years have you done this, Ed? 23. How many? 23. 23, so I, quit after uh, 10. <laughs> I think the board is pretty confident that you have it down. So it'll be interesting. Uh, my only question for you is, um, and, and, and this is, I mean, you can do whatever you want. We're just to, to, to support or not support the parade route. But if you do a halfway, are we going to be able to do a regular one next year? Yes. Okay. Um, basically, the parade was ready to go when it was canceled last uh, yeah, a year ago. So as far as that goes, we don't have to do any really any fundraising or anything. Um, we still have all that money still in our bank account. So it, it's basically just um, the logistics at the new senior center parking lot versus the old uh, gate school where we use that for part of our setup. So, um, but it, primarily we just, I have to make sure that I have enough staff that will be able to work on that day and um, have enough entertainment to come and perform. So that's why at this point, it's not a, a done deal. It's just, you know, trying to get it together. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tony. And yeah, just wanted to kind of ask you what, like why you're doing it, what's the premise behind it? And is it gonna take away from the, you know, the March event? Um, I don't think it would take away from the March event. Um, it's kind of like taking care of what we had already and then we can start it new like we normally do in January. So again, it's up in the year. Some of the people I've spoken to think that we should wait until March and that way, you know, the businesses that have been supporting us, um, you know, they may not have the money to put out again come next March. So maybe, you know, thought is maybe we should just save that and be guaranteed to have something for next March. So I still have some, you know, things to work out, so. I just hate for you to see you put all the work and energy into it and not get the great turnout from the town. Right, um, again, uh, um, it, it's gonna be based on you know, whether I was thinking of putting out on uh, Situate Monthly a, um, a poll, see what kind of reaction we get. <laughs> but um, again, it's all gonna be come down to whether it's logistically possible to put it together with everything that's going on in September. I mean, the idea came up, I said, okay, we'll see if we can first of all get approved for it. If we can, then we'll work on trying to put everything together and if we can't, then we'll just scrub it until March. So like I say, it's not a done deal yet. It's just um, hoping that maybe we can do something. I mean, from gathering people I've spoken to of the general public, they're all thrilled to death that they'd have some big party to have, you know? So after all we've gone through, so. Well, speaking of that, um, Lorraine, do we, have we traditionally had any events on the calendar at, on that date 
uh, you know, road races and things like that. I just want to, if somebody, if somebody already is around that date, we should know about it. We don't have anything right now on that date. Okay. All right. Well, then it makes sense if I were you, Mr. Kelly, to grab the date. Um, yep. So, but that's, that's up to you, Maura. Um, thank you, Karen. I just had a couple, I had one question, Ed, and then just one comment as well. So one question was, what is, why do you need to use the senior center cafeteria? What do you use that for? Because I don't remember you going inside at Gates in the past. In, in Gates, we've always used their cafeteria. Okay, uh, you did. We, we provide water and snacks for the marchers. Okay. So, um, you know, typically in March, it's cold, so it's a good place for them to hang out. Um, right. Obviously, we're hoping in September it's not going to be cold, um, so they're not going to be hanging around in there per se. But it would be the place where we would pass out the water and the snacks that we normally get donated for us for the marchers. Okay. We would have to find a different place for that because the cafeteria of the old gates is used by the food pantry now. Right. Right. Well, that's why he's he's requesting but, the one in the yeah. senior center, Jim. Yeah. Um, so I understand that. Um, my other sentiment is just that I'm sort of with Tony, you know, I'd love to see you just wait until March and really have a great celebration on St. Patrick's Day, but that's up to you, right? That's, I mean, I support you your know, parade route and anything I'll, you want to do, but. I'm okay either way, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I say, some people have been saying, oh yeah, let's do it. Let's, you know, it will be a good way to have a celebration and uh, so on and so forth. Um, I mean, for me, it's going to be a ton of work because I have to put everything together again. Yeah, do it so, twice. Yeah. Or, you know. Um, and I like, I, I think your sentiment, I mean, I think your thoughts about uh, the businesses maybe not being able to donate as much in March, uh, just because they're still recuperating and getting back right. up to speed that, this that summer. Good. Right. I, mean, I think that's very respectful and actually pretty smart. And maybe you just, you know, give that a little bit more consideration yep. in your, your decision. Okay. Well, if I can add my two cents, perhaps um, a special event that's called Halfway to St. Patrick's Day to do some fundraising. It's a, it's a cute idea. It's a cute slogan. Ah, that is a good idea. Not necessarily have a parade, but right. have a fundraising event. Yes. I like that idea. And I think people would think it was fun and contribute to the next St. Patrick's Day and yeah, that's uh, all right. I, I like that idea. Um, I think we'll bring that to the committee and um, see if we can put something together to do something on that date. So anyway, let's reserve that date for us and we'll yes, get yes. in there. <laughs> all right. So I, I don't think we need to vote this, or do we? I think he's voting right. for Yes, you yeah. do have to vote it. You want, so what, what are we voting? Well, can I just make a comment? Yes. Um, so the board's responsibility in this matter is to see if the plan that Mr. Kelly has presented is acceptable to the town with all of the you know, impact on the community should he have a parade. So that's what we should vote on and he can reserve it. Because of his extensive experience in this, I personally am completely comfortable approving that date and let him figure out whether it makes sense or not um, because this is he's this is not his first rodeo, <laughs> in my opinion. So um, and, and the plans are basically the same that as they've been for years, and so I have no problem with the reserving that date for him. So I'd be happy to make a motion if that's what the chair would like. That's fine with me, unless someone has another comment. Tony, did you? Yeah, I I, I guess I, you know I I agree with Karen that I support you if you want to if you want to go through the work of running the event. Are you? Are you coming to the board? Do you care what we care? <laughs> you know, yeah. are you asking us whether we think it's a good idea or you just yeah, want to? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I've been polling people uh, for the last month. Every time I see somebody, I ask them what they think. You know, and so yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm all for Listen, your thoughts. I mean, we're not going to stop your effort. You've done such a great job, and if this is something you want to get behind, yep. I think we're all going to support you. Yeah. Um, but, you know. So you got to kind of let us know what you're looking for. If you want to do it, we're going to probably going to vote to let you do it. Okay. I think there's a couple of us that think maybe it should wait to St. Patrick's Day, but yeah, that's up to you. So you tell us what you want, and we'll kind of. Yeah. Okay. But like I was saying, the whole point of it was to 
observe the day in case we were able to, if we had no roadblocks, if it was, again, I have to pull some of our corporate sponsors and, uh, you know, I'm going to send them an email out saying, what are your thoughts as far as your ability to continue to support us if we do a secondary parade, you know, in March or the next one. Um, so I can say there's still some, some thoughts of what we have to do to get it done. So um, go ahead. Madam Chair, yes. I just, I, ha I have no problem uh, voting for it, but also I just ask Ed, if you do decide uh, to not move forward to, you know, rescind the permit and let Lorraine know, because there are a lot of um, road races that happen in September. Okay. Uh, for charity events and people are just ramping up and starting to reorganize all those yep. things. They're all coming back to life. So um, I just ask that you not linger all the way to the end of August. Oh, no, no, no. I, I will okay. let you know, I will let you know by mid July at the latest. All right. How's do that? I, do I hear a motion? Move to approve the special event permit to Ed Kelly for the halfway to St. Patrick's Day Parade scheduled for September 19th, 2021 from 12 p.m. until 4 p.m. with a setup beginning at 10 a.m. and a takedown at 4 p.m. pending certification, uh, certificate of liability insurance and fee. Do I see a second? Second by Mr. Bagnani. This requires a roll call vote. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. All right. Thank you, too. All right. Have, have a good home. night. All right. Thank good you. Bye-bye. I see that we have the Chamber of Commerce Heritage Days on the schedule uh, with Elaine Bonkerzone. I is that, Did I pronounce that correctly? You did. Good. <laughs> Um, would you identify yourself and your address, please, for okay. the record? Helene Bonga Zone, 17 Gate Circle. Excellent. All right. Would you like to tell us about Heritage Days? I know everyone is really excited you're coming back. I know. We are, too. But we're, we're working harder in, because it's a shorter period of time. Oh, I'm sure. It also, we'll be smaller. Um, we're not utilizing, we're not going to be on Front Street. Um, it's all going to be in Cole Parkway. Uh, in the Dory races down in Museum Beach and the Blessing of the Fleet, hopefully um, the Town Pier. So those are the only places that we really are going to, Oda Street in Cole Parkway is where we'll be setting up and closing off. Um, okay. Don't know if you got the map, but the street that goes by the gazebo will remain open because police fire want that open you know, if they have to get someplace. So right. behind CVS will be cordoned off. But okay. basically it'll be the amusements, the vendors, um, the music in the beer garden. Um, I'm calling it a beer garden, but there's wine and uh, uh, cells, uh, spritzer. Okay. Um, music will be smaller, either a flatbed or a small stage. It's not gonna be the great big stage that we usually have. Um, we. We're doing it smaller for many reasons, one of which we don't have the money to, we don't have the time to raise the money. Right. Um, those big stages and, and the lo the bands are gonna be local. They're not the big name bands. Um, they're from the South Shore area for the most part or situate. We, okay. Um, and, and basically that's, most of the things are the same on the schedule, you know, the, the kitty carnival, the, petting zoo, the food court, um, let me see, uh, fisherman's event. Oh, I did have that on the town pier with the fisherman. Joby Norton's going to be handling that portion of it. Um, Tucker Patterson's going to be handling the dory races. Uh, I'm calling them dory races, they're boat races, um, but they're all paddle, it's nothing, you know, no motors. Um, and Matt Elder, who's on the he, he's here too. He can go into detail if you have any questions about the beer beer garden. Yes, that's next on our agenda. Right. Okay. So, um, and I guess anything else you you know I welcome you know I'll answer any questions. Does the board have any questions, Mr. Vignani? Hi, Elaine. Are the uh, historical sites going to be open as well? 
we're not involved with it, but I'll say probably because they usually are. Okay, uh, we will be talking to the historical society. Uh, we won't. We it, we've tried having a shuttle bus. It just doesn't work. Um, but I I just can't commit to that. But my feeling is yes. Right. Yeah. Anyone else? Karen Canfield. Hi, Elaine. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for the backup and the plan as always extremely, um, it's an amazing lift. And um, I personally am so excited about this sort of reconstituted local focus thing. I mean, I think where we're coming out of the pandemic and everything, it, you know, it's like a great big hug to the community. I love it. Um, my questions are, mostly practical. So because you're not doing Front Street, there basically is going to be no public parking down in the harbor. So we all, you know, people are going to park it at the village market. Have you talked to the to the owners about, you know, as much as I like the plan of shuttling people from from the parking lots, but we all know that we're all basically lazy people and we're going to go to the closest place. Well, that's a problem every year, but I think um, same with St. Mary's Church too. I think they have somebody there that doesn't let you park there. Village Market does. Okay, they ha they hire a couple of kids. Okay, and, you know they're not going to park. They're not going to take th that whole lot out over, um, only because I don't think the fact that it's on Front Street will change the parking problem at all. I think they'll still. They may try to park at St. Mary's, but I don't think they'll be able to. And I don't think they'll be able to park at the village market. Will, will a couple of people manage to sneak through? Probably. But he usually has a couple of young kids there. Okay. Um, so the parking will be at the Green Bush primarily? Is that the plan? Yes. yes. Okay. I love it. Um, great. Um, no, I'm, I, I'm excited. Thank you for doing all this work. I know it's a huge lift. Yeah, no, there's, there's just a few of us, but there's a lot of work we can do right. there. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Ms. Karn? Um, hi, Elaine. Um, yeah, parking won't be any different, so I can back you up on that one, um, especially with Front Street being open. Um, my question is, I am not, I'm not familiar with what the fishermen's activities are. I'm really curious as to what you'll be doing over on the fishermen's pier. Okay, well, these were Joby's thoughts. Um, he was... Again, it's not set in stone. They're not going to be getting on boats. There's a liability. Don't worry. It'll be geared towards children, but they won't be getting on any fishing boats. He'll have fishermen talking. Maybe Frank Marachi. I don't know. He hasn't been asked, but he said he'd have some games, maybe some contests, but there'd be demonstrations to show the kids the fish or the different kinds of boats. Oh, that's um, great. We're saying so 12 to 4. Okay. to cover our bases, but it probably will not be four hours. But I did want to say one to three and then have somebody there till four. So we, jo uh, Joby and I discussed it and we thought, we know we can keep it within those four hours, probably not take those four hours, but better to, you know, at least tell you. They were also, I had a call in to Drew. I haven't heard from him. He was thinking of doing the oyster shucking also. They've done that in the past. They did it on um, Otis Street. So he'd like to do some oyster shucking if it's okay with Drew. Um, and then basically talk, showing the kids about the fish, the history of fishing in Situate. Um, I mean, we really have, we have the lobster boats, the trawl. We have a lot of things that most towns don't have. And he said, he'd like to illustrate and let them see all the different facets. I think that's that's a great yeah. idea. It'll be more safe. educational. It'll be awesome. That's um, what it is. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. I um, if I'm not mistaken, if Joby does decide to do oysters, doesn't he have to come back for a separate permit? Anyone? I'm sure if he does what? If he does shuck oysters there, Jim. That's what he's going to be doing. The Board of Health first, and then depending okay. upon exactly what it's that has be, to go. Right? To I did try to get a hold of Drew and I've missed him. Keep missing him. Okay. But um, yeah, I, I would start with Drew and if only because we've done it in the past, I think he'd allow it, but he might not. 
And if he does, you know, that's it. <laughs> if he does, if he says no, then we don't do it. So this is Lorraine's. So just a quick, uh, Elaine sent an email late this afternoon that I forwarded to the board to expand the uh, motion to approve this, uh, to include the town pier with those dates and times and a couple of other things. So just, just a reminder that that came late this afternoon. And we could say pending board of health approval on the oyster shucking piece. Absolutely. We could do that on Bassett's Beach if you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Can't follow that one. Yes, I see your hand is raised. I just don't see your name. Jean DeJacom Andrea. Oh, okay. Thank you. Jean, your, uh, your address for the record, too? We're going to ask her to unmute. Oh, know. could you unmute yourself, please? 26 Oakhurst Road. Thank you. I just wanted to add to what Elaine has said. Um, we are planning the lighted boat parade on the Friday night before Heritage Days. I've already talked with the um, uh, Harbor Master and they have all the information. I'm pending um, an, a permit from the Coast Guard to approve that for us. So that is something we'll be doing. And as far as the um, Historical Society goes, we will be having a concert at um, Lawson Tower on Sunday afternoon to kind of wrap up the whole weekend. At this point, they are not sure if or what um, sites will be open. You know, they're concerned about their volunteers. The, a lot of their volunteers are older. They still may not be comfortable coming out. So there's all those questions that are going on with that. They're hoping to at least have some, excuse me, something open, but they're just not sure yet. Understandable. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Yes, Andrew? Mr. Goodrich? What's the, um, what's been kind of the temperature of some of the, the businesses right, right there on Front Street with the closure? Are they happy with this plan? Or are they, what's, what's kind of the, the feedback from, uh, from those folks. I just always, anytime we're bringing in outside vendors, um, you know, I just want to make sure that our, our local folks are, are happy about what's happening. So right. it's hear what they're saying. Yeah. Some of them, it doesn't make much difference. Um, and then some of them, you know, I, we didn't, ha I haven't heard anything either way very strong. Uh, they probably like the fact that it's not on Front Street, but they haven't expressed that. And I've talked to several of them. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of retail there either, as you well know, a lot of service industry on Front Street, which would like to see more retail, but it seems to be banks, um, real estate offices, uh, things, you know, things like that, so which doesn't really affect them. Uh, there's, a, there's not many businesses, retail businesses, especially between Mountain One Bank and Rudolph Adamo, and that's really the section that we, we might have closed, although we went a little further last time. We have gone a little further, but none of us, we're not gonna be on Front Street at all, just so you understand. I, I can't see how anyone wouldn't like it. I'll put it that way. I haven't heard any objections. Okay, yeah, I've just, I've, I'll just tell you, I have in the past heard objections from folks and I just wanted to just raise it to make sure that we're supporting our local business and not taking business away from them. So I well, love the efforts that we're doing. I love what we're, what we're trying to do, but you know, and I, I love the local you, focus. Yeah, we discussed it this year, especially. Uh, lots of times, um, hopefully the local businesses, we give them the opportunity to come out on Front Street at, at a reduced rate. So we try to work with them. But this year, because they've all had such a hardship, yeah. well, most of them have the retails. So I, I think it's, a benefit to them, more so than any other year. All right, any other questions from the board? I, ju I just have one question about parking on the side streets. Um, I know some of the streets don't allow parking anyway, but are, are we putting up signs where there are side streets where you could park? You know, uh, I can tell you we've never done it. 
I'm not saying we, sh we, we shouldn't, but we've never done it. And yeah, someone could correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't heard a problem with that. I've not heard of a problem with them parking on the front, on the side streets. I think the people on Otis have had uh, significantly more traffic over the past year than they had. So they have, um, and I know people on Otis, but that was because of um, the, the street one being closed for the, yeah. for the restaurants. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyone from the audience? I don't see anyone. I do see Mr. Vignani again. I, just at the end, I just wanted to take one second uh, and thank you from the board for putting this together. It's just getting us back to some level of normalcy. And uh, when it was announced that it was going to happen, really many, many people in the town were really happy to see that at whatever level you can do it. So thank you for putting the effort in and really getting Glad us to hear that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Way. So so thanks, Elaine, and everybody else. Thank you. Helping. Yeah, between that and the KFC Carnival, we're back. <laughs> All right. Um, so do I hear a motion? No one. We have the revised. There's a the revised one. Uh, Lorraine sent separately late today. Uh, it, it, I, it it came an email. I have yes. waiting the screens open. <laughs> All right. Well, Lorraine, do you want to read it for us and we can? Yes, I'd be happy to read it here. Thank you. Well, actually, I think she said Lorraine, not Elaine. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> but that's okay. You're not allowed to make a motion, but thank you. For that. <laughs> um, if you want to read the uh, original special event permit, and then I will just add the addenda. Okay, move to approve a special event permit to the Chamber of Commerce for Heritage Days as follows. Friday, August 6, 2021, Luminaria and Boat Parade in the Harbor. Um, should I pause and have you amend there or no, or wait till the end? I would wait till the end. Okay, Saturday, August 7, 2021, Boat Races Mu Museum Beach Jericho Road, Saturday, August 7, 2021, uh, 9, to 8, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., Music and Vendors at Cole Parkway, Saturday, August 8, 2021, 9 a.m. I'm sorry, Sunday, August 8. I'm sorry, Sunday, August, um, wait a minute. Oh, that helps. Okay. Sunday, August 8, 2021, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., Music and Vendors on Cole Parkway with setup times being Friday, August 6th from 5 p.m. Um, for amusement rides at the Cole Parkway, Saturday, August 7th at 5 a.m., God bless you, um, uh, for the stage, beer garden and vendor, and take down, take down time Saturday, August 7th, 9 p.m., and uh, Sunday, August 8th at 7 p.m., amended with? Town Pier, Friday, August 6th, 7.30 to 10 p.m. for the lighted boat parade, Sunday, August 8th from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. for oyster shucking contests pending Board of Health approval and children's activities. Activities would be talks and illustration regarding the fishing industry, boats, etc. Also request permission to close off the music and beer garden area Friday, August 6th at 3 p.m. to start set up for the next day's program. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second by Mr. Pagnani. This requires a roll call vote. Can I, I have, I have one question I forgot. Okay. <laughs> um, there was a comment by the Harbor Master and I think you've already addressed it that you um, tried to discourage folks from using the Harbor Ma Master facilities as it is right next to the beer garden. <laughs> um, I saw that in the backup. Um, and Elaine, I think you already have in the backup that you're going to have um, porta potties and such. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Try to be mindful because that facility really can't handle a ton of people. Okay. So Thank motion. Yeah. Roll call Second. vote. Miss Miss Conley. Yes. Miss Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Miss Karen. Yes. Miss Mr. Vignani. Yes. All right. Motion carries. Five to nothing. Um, now we have a Heritage Days one day wine and malt license for Cole Parkway Beer Garden on 8 7 and 8 8 from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, Matt Elder, do I see you? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Could you say your name, your address for the record, please? Six Old Country Way. Thank you. Old Brewing. Would you like to tell us about your beer garden? Yeah, so we're happy to have the opportunity to do another beer garden. Yeah. Heritage Days. We missed out last year, like everybody. Uh, we are basically looking to do kind of the same thing with some improvements over two years ago. 
So we'll use the same general area in Cole Parkway. There will be right up near where the music is going to be set up. Uh, we are partnering kind of with the Greenbush General Store, Marty Block down there to kind of provide, we'll, we'll do the beer, because that's what we know and do best, I think. And Marty's going to help provide some other options for people who don't drink beer, uh, wine, spritzers, as Elaine mentioned. And the focus, once again, is going to be on a family-friendly, community-focused beer garden, um, just highlighting what Situate has to offer. Um, we are planning to go a little bigger with the space this year, and it's kind of counterintuitive, but we're expecting fewer people. So by going bigger, we just want to make sure it is a safe, comfortable environment, uh, inviting environment where people aren't, you know, shoulder to shoulder with each other. Um, and, and just hopefully by going a little bigger this time, provide some more seating options for uh, our younger patrons, the kids uh, that come with their parents and, you know, provide some more space to set up tents and a little more shade. So the improvements are really focused on just making it a little more comfortable this year uh, in case we get a really hot day or in case it rains, you know, hopefully it won't. Uh, but in general, it's going to be more or less the same setup as last time. Who can remember two years ago, right? <laughs> uh, does the board have any questions? No? Oh, Tony, Mr. Bagnani. Yeah, it was Mac, great success last time you guys did it. The only thing I'd ask is, do you think you can have uh, a non-alcoholic alternate drink there as well? I think you did last year and had waters and stuff there for- Absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah. Yep, we had water, Gatorade. I think we're gonna add uh, maybe another option or two, but yeah, absolutely. Try That'd to great. provide as many options as we can for everybody. Yeah, and it, it's a family event. I mean, people went in there and really enjoyed it. And it's so yeah. thanks for doing it again. Anybody else? Mara Curran? Hi, Matt. Um, question for you. Were the hours in 2019 till 8 p.m. on Sunday night, they seem a little longer this year, so I'm just not, uh, confident that that's the same time frame. They are. I, I believe last time we were 12 to 8 on Saturday and 12 to 7 on Sunday. Mm -hmm. We'll probably keep those same hours. We went 11. We are talking with the chamber because the chamber especially was really hit hard with uh, funds from last year, not this whole thing not happening. We are discussing potentially doing a, a like first hour ticketed event. Uh, Untold would provide a special beer uh, and some kind of commemorative item. I'm not sure what that's going to be yet. We're looking into the options, but it would be ticketed and then 100% of the ticket proceeds would go back to the chamber to help fund this whole thing. So that's why we added that hour on the front end to make that kind okay. of like VIP hour. And then uh, I, I don't see us going past seven on Sunday. Like, okay. If you don't want that's to be past seven, yeah, that's time to wrap up. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a great idea. Uh, thank you for offering that fundraising yeah. hour. That's a great idea. And you did a great job. I remember 2019. So thank you. It was very well run. Thanks. I'm hoping for a repeat performance. We are too. <laughs> very good. Anyone else? I don't um, see anyone else. It's Lorraine. I just have one thing. I'm sorry. I, did, I would just like to add when you read the motion that you add Greenbush General Store to the motion. All right. Did so anyone still be providing the wine. Okay. Everyone hear that? Any, any questions from the audience? I don't see anybody. All right, do I hear a motion? Move that the sure. select board, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. Uh, move that the select board approve a one day wine and malt liquor license for the 2021 Heritage uh, Days event, Until Brewing Company LLC and uh, Greenbush. Um, general store. Uh, the Greenbush, sorry, Greenbush General Store, Beer Guard on Cole Parkway, Saturday, August. Uh, 7th, 2021, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, also, Untold Brewing LLC and Greenbush General Store, Beer Garden on Cole Parkway, Sunday, August 8th, 2021, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Second. Second by Ms. Curran. This requires a roll call vote. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignano. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Good luck. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Matt. Good luck, Matt.
All right, next on the agenda is discuss, vote, and outdoor entertainment <coughs> permit for DJ at 12 Wheeler Avenue on 821 from 3 to 10 p.m. Margaret Connolly, resident. Do I see Ms. Connolly? I'm here. Oh, very good. Could you state your address for the record, please? 12 Wheeler Avenue. I just said that, didn't I? <laughs> okay, would it's you okay. like to tell, tell us why, why you're having a party? Having a party. My daughter, our daughter is getting married at 2 p.m. at St. Mary's and then doing the reception back at our cottage um, at 12 Wheeler Avenue. Very good. Does anyone have any questions? It's nice we're able to have weddings again. I know. So, yes, Ms. Um, Canfield. So, so it's a DJ amplified in the yard. Is that the plan? Correct. And it's still 10 o'clock and you obviously you've told all the neighbors and I'm Correct. sure everyone's thrilled for you because we we're having <laughs> weddings. Yeah, they they're actually, they're very excited. They've all been very kind. Uh, well, congratulations. Thank you. No, best wishes to the bride, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I Audience? just want to, I just, Ms. Carr, no, that's a, yeah, I just thought, um, are all your neighbors aware parking will probably be all along the street or are you shuttling yeah. people over? Parking, parking is going to be up the street at the, at the old St. Francis. Um, oh, perfect. It's, a, it's another Christian church, but I've already yep. got permission to park up there. Oh, perfect. Great. Thank so you. No, no parking. Okay. All right. No problem. Thanks. All right. Well, not seeing anyone else wanting to comment or say anything. If I could have a motion, please. Move to grant an outdoor entertainment light, uh, permit to Mark Conley, 12 Wheeler Avenue, who is hosting a wedding in her daughter's honor reception on August 21st, 2021. Guests arrive at 3 p.m. A DJ is scheduled to bribe provide live music and the event scheduled to end at 10 p.m. Can I hear a second? Second. Second by Mr. Bagnani. This requires a roll call vote. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Absolutely, yes. Ms. <laughs> Curran. Yes. Mr. Bagnani. Yes. Best wishes to the bride and groom. The motion carries. Thank you very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Congratulations. Have fun. Oh, thanks. We will. Thank you. Bye-bye. On to the next uh, 725 discussion vote DPW contracts. Not as much fun as a wedding or heritage days, but Kevin, I think I see Kevin Cafferty here. For some people, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, the do contracts. Tell. <laughs> do tell. But we do have, um, we've got two contracts, the standard contracts we use every year um, for the wastewater treatment plant that goes out in the cooperative bid. Um, the first one is for polymer um, that's used to remove the copper from the um, wastewater stream. Um, pretty straightforward. I can answer any questions if anybody has any. Do I see anyone? Mr. Bagnani? Sorry. I, and maybe it's in there, but is it more expensive or, or less expensive than last year? In 2018, we we're paying $2.08. We are $2.08 in 2021. So that's a good one. The next one, the price has changed. So the polymer is two thirty nine, right? Is that I'm up sorry. to Um No, the polymer was 208. It has not changed. Uh, I got it backwards. I'm sorry. So polymer is 239 and 239. Changed. In in 2019, it was 225. 2016, it was $1.95. So it's increased 14 cents and 30 cents on the polymer. Thanks. Anyone else? Maura, Karin? Did nope. I see your hand? Uh, nope. Ms. Con uh, Canfield, I'm Ms. Connolly. Ms. Canfield. Um, right. So the cost of this is already built into our budget. It, this is just the contract, correct? Correct. To a point, we didn't have the exact rate when it went up, but yeah. the contract's good for three years. So we'll have it for the following two after that. Okay. It's Thank you. And there's, I just want to note, there's less of Mr. Cafferty than last week. <laughs> ah, you're right. <laughs> Welcome back. I guess the pandemic is over. <laughs> On the gym, no, he's waiting another week or two, but it's, you know, it's, it's time to clean up. Yeah, we, we, we look very distinguished, Mr. Captain. <laughs> well done. Thank you. 
Any more comments? <laughs> Does the audience have anything to add? No? Like okay. a motion? Yes, please. Move Ms. to Carter. award the contract to Atlantic Coast Polymers to provide polymer cationic in the amount not to exceed $100,000 for up to three years at a unit price of $2.39 per pound. Do I hear a second? Second. Be a second. Second by Ms. Canfield. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes, 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 yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 5-0, thank you. We need a second motion on the uh, methanol, is that right? Or did- The next one is on methanol and that price, I had them reversed. I had the wrong sheets in front of me. Since 2018, that's been $2.08. Uh, so that one did not change. All right, any questions or comments about ethanol? I see nobody. Uh, could I hear a motion, please? Move, Move to award, the, award con the contract to Univar Solutions USA Incorporated to provide methanol in the amount not to exceed $150,000 for up to three years at a unit price of $2.08 per gallon. Motion made by Ms. Curran, seconded by Mr. Vagnani. That was your hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, roll call vote. That, I said that, yes, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, yes, sorry. No, that's all right. Um, Ms. Conley? I think it was an internet. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Canfield? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Motion carries 5-0, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. <coughs> all right, next up, we have discuss vote approval of caterer and one day wine and malt uh, license for exquisite, exquisite event catering, David Roberts owner. I think I see him. I think you skipped um, a 533 country way. It's on the no, agenda. No, I, I was told that I was told that was off. Yeah, I just, I just want to let the board know that should be all taken care of. All right. Without skipping over it. There's a stone wall there that needs to be breached for the uh, owner to, to get his plot project before the planning board. Uh, with Kevin out of town, I don't think anybody really wanted to take the responsibility to allow him to breach that wall. Kevin's been in touch with uh, Mr. Bjorklund and the builder, so I think they're all set on that. And I think, Kevin, correct me, we don't need to take any action on this at this point, correct? No, everything's in the right of way, so it, it falls under our purview, I believe. All right, any questions? Any comments from anyone? Sorry, I forgot to mention it was taken off the agenda, but thank you for the explanation, Jim. Um, the next item is to discuss approval of caterer and one day wine and malt license for exquisite event catering, David Roberts owner. Uh, this is for an exquisite events uh, at Situate Maritime Center on 613 from 6 to 10 p.m. for a private event. Is Mr. Roberts here? I'm not sure. Yep, he needs I'm here. To can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you this evening? Good, how are you? Doing very well, thank you. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Roberts? Yes, Ms. Uh, Canfield? Uh, two quick questions. Um, yeah. One's for Lorraine. Uh, Mr. Roberts is on the exquisite um, catering. Is that on our approved list already? It is not. So, so Mr. Roberts would, would like to be added to the approved list of caterers. Okay. Uh, in addition, he has an event coming up and we would like to once, once if you choose to authorize him to serve events in Situate, we would like to authorize a one day event for him for his uh, upcoming yeah, event. Thank you for clarifying that. I thought I, I was, it was, I was a little confused because it was, it was sort of double dipping here and all of the paperwork is in order, but I am thoroughly Im intimidated by exquisite because <laughs> <laughs> that's a really high bar, but. Um, yeah. So, and where, um, where are you based out of? Where's your kitchen? Oh, so, yours. So, we're not actually services to a number of catering companies, and we also have bar services. Um, I'm based right now uh, in Cambridge, but we cover New England. Um, caterers that I mainly work with right now 
now are the Catered Affair, uh, catering by Andrew. Um, we have a daily event at the Myopia Hunt Club as well. Um, but Boston Public Library, Harvard Art Museum, the ICA, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Um, and we're also the preferred vendor for the Lexington Historical Society as well. So, um, um, so uh, we get around. <laughs> I like it. Ms. Canfield? So are, do you sub with Catered Affair or do you just partner with them? I mean, how does that work? So we... David, you're breaking up, sorry. Partner with them more or less to provide them with additional. Can you can you hear me better, regularly To provide them with additional backup support for all their events, uh, servers, bartenders, culinary staff, etc. Um, we've had a long-standing relationship with them, and um, this year we've actually even gone further. They're giving us six months advanced worth of events uh, to actually, you know, staff out with them as well. Mm -hmm. So actually tomorrow night um, I'm hosting uh, or sponsoring the annual ILEA Gala. Um, we're coming in as a sponsor to them and um, bringing in Prosecco from Vera Wang actually and introducing that to the market um, and hoping that the catered affair picks it up as well. So, well, well my yeah. hands in a number of indeed. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to Situ. You are indeed exquisite and good company. <laughs> Thank you for answering those. Oh, so, any other questions from any of the board oh, or from it. the okay. audience? I'm not, uh, Mr. Vignani? Just on the same note that Karen mentioned. So, typically, so it, it looks like you, like Karen said, sub out different catering companies that you work with. I mean, I could see for this one event. But typically the licenses, or when we put you on the list, it's because you are the caterer, not because you can get a caterer. So yep. I don't so know So we do, we do separately from the staffing, we do bar catering. We don't necessarily do actual food catering. That's where we have partnered up with caterers, uh, uh, if you will. So, you so we do have, side. we are fully licensed. Exactly. We're fully licensed and insured um, to do the beverage side of things. So is that what your request um, but in is addition, going to be? We also, yes, the, for, for the future, my request is that um, we'll be able to come in as a vendor to provide uh, those, those services. Our services only. Exactly. Yes. Per, per. I'm sorry. I'm just not clear. It's Lorraine. I apologize. Are you a state authorized caterer, 12, 12C uh, ABCC licensed state caterer? So we don't have uh, the 12C because we're not, we don't sell alcohol. We work, we have licensed insured bartenders. We kind of have worked with our clients to set up, uh, you know, bar lists, bartending lists, uh, and we go and execute. We bring all the glassware, the mixers, etc. As long as the alcohol is there, which okay. you know, normally I just I really want to clarify them. and just pin it down a little bit more, because yep. you are only allowed to to serve beer and wine unless you have uh -huh. a state liquor license. Right. Okay. So I got nervous when you started saying mixers and things. Okay. Yeah, no, no, we're not bringing any mixers. I'm not doing any cocktails uh, here at this event. Okay, I just want to make sure the board clearly understands what you're looking for. So you're looking for mm -hmm. a beer and wine only license, and you want to be on our, our catering list to serve beer and wine. That's what I, I'm hearing you say. Because that's not what we requested of the board. That's what I'm trying to clarify. His internet yes. froze. <laughs> right. For, so you're not looking to serve any food. Um, but yeah. is there is there going to be a difference? That's I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there a difference if I want to do like bar setup without 
alcohol. No, no, or liquor. Hello, hear me. Yeah, this is hard to hear. Is anyone you're, else you're going in and out? I'm sorry. There is a difference if hey, you're going you guys, to. Sorry, yeah, no, I, I just completely broke up too. Sorry. There is a difference if you're going to serve beer and wine, or you're going to serve hard liquor. Yep. It's different right. licensing required. So, are you only going to be serving beer and wine? Yes, only beer and wine. Okay. Are you going to be serving any food? No. Okay. Is you there someone only... serving? Is there someone serving food? Okay. So you're only going to be asking. You're only asking the select board to get on our list for alcohol bar services for beer and wine. Correct. Okay. Now, for what now. about what about your event on June thirteenth? Do they think that you're serving them food? No. Okay, so you're only want to serve beer and wine for them. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I'm sorry I'm giving you the third degree. Yep, no, it's happened. It's all right. Okay, no. so just no. to clarify to the board, they are really looking to be added as a bartending service to the list that we have for the town of Situate to serve beer and wine. And they are not a state licensed caterers so they cannot serve other alcohol. So my question is, is there food being served by a caterer at that event? Well, we don't usually have you vote on who's serving the food. They can have any caterer they want serve well, the food. It's, it's to my knowledge, they do have food that is being served there um yes, they are serving food, who the but... caterer is not entirely sure they said that they hired all the services completely separately uh right. just uh, to work within their budget they're kind of more of a do-it-yourself uh, uh couple i guess you could say all right all right that's clear as mud to me but um if do i hear a motion well is everybody is everybody clear? Mm -hmm. I mean, I am, but I just want to make sure everybody else is too. Well, that's fine. I don't okay. understand the finer points of this. That's what I guess I'm expressing. So do I hear a motion, please? Will the board sure. select approve the one day <laughs> wine and malt license for exquisite event service for a wedding event at the Situate Maritime Center on Sunday, June 13th, 2021 from 5 p.m. until 11 p.m as well as approve the addition of exquisite event services to the approved bartending services for beer and wine for both the Citrus Maritime Center and the Citrus Harbor Community Building. All right, second. Uh, motion by Mr. Vagnani, seconded by Ms. Canfield. This requires a roll call mm -hmm. vote. Uh, Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vagnani. Yes. Okay, I did look up, just to answer your question, Ms. Conley, I did look up the applicant uh, application to, re to reserve the Maritime Center, and they said they were doing their own food. All right. Thank okay, you. So they will be providing their own food. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, David. Right. I thank you. Didn't have to drive yeah, thank you. She carries 5 0, if I didn't say that already. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, we'll be sending you a letter uh, tomorrow. Um, okay. Mr. Roberts, okay? This is Lorraine. And I'll, yeah, and I'll move forward and uh, look forward yes, to forward, uh, yes. doing more events over in your town. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so we're a little ahead of schedule, so I don't know. We, we're on to a discuss vote a public uh, camping at the uh, on conservation land with uh, Mr. Frank Snow, the chair of the Conservation Commission. I don't know if he's here. I, I, if he is, he's going to have to he's, raise He's hand. Janet Bristol. Thanks, oh, sir. he's Janet Bristol. Okay. Hello, Frank. Frank? And uh, Mr. Snow should be able to unmute himself and start his video if he so wishes. Frank, did you hear that? I did. Okay. I don't, I don't have a video. <laughs> okay. So. All right. 
So Mr. Snow, could you identify yourself with your address, please? Sure, I'm Frank Snow, uh, Chair of the Conservation Commission, 189 Clap Road. All right, um, thank you. Would you like to tell us why you're here tonight? Um, thanks for taking the time to listen to this. So um, this is in regards to a, a request that the Conservation Commission received from the uh, Troop 7 uh, Situate Scouts asking if they could do camping on uh, conservation property. And um, the, uh, the, as I look through our, our um, information I have for the Conservation Commission, um, this is something that we're able to do in discussing it with Mr. Boudreau. It seemed like we should also discuss this with, with the um, Board of Selectmen as well. Um, maybe I can give you a little bit of background as to what happened. Um, so I was approached by um, Dr. Nico um, Alfonsenko, he's the scout master for Troop 7, um, about having the opportunity to camp on town property. The uh, um, scouts were not able to camp last summer um, because of COVID and they were not able to um, reserve any spots for this year to camp at any of the scout sites. So they were looking for the opportunity to camp um, on town property. And so um, what I did was I asked our commission if, if anybody had any thoughts or objections, there, there weren't. Um, I started down the road of discussing um, this with different town officials, the fire department, the police department, the board of health, building department, um, just to get their thoughts on all this, as well as um, with the scouting organization, the requirements that they have. So we started that process and then started to look at places where this might be able to take place. And um, I think a few of the things that we were looking at was trying to find a location that was possibly a little more secluded. Um, you know, a lot of the town property um, does abut other residential areas. So we started to look at, at some of those locations in talking with the Board of Health they felt that the best solution for bathroom facilities was a porta potty. So we had to think about that um, in terms of where that could be placed and how it could be serviced. Um, other things with the fire department and their concerns, they, they gave us some regulations on what they would have required to have a fire or a fire pit. Also um, access in case of an emergency um, if, uh, if something should happen. And then the same thing with the police department. So we went through all that and um, trying to come up with a, a location that may, um, may be suitable for the scouts to do that. And so that's where we're at right now. And we still don't have a specific location for this to happen. Um, we also checked with, um, the CR holder or, or what will be the CR holder when, when the conservation restrictions are complete on the land that was purchased with community preservation funds as to whether this was permissible and they responded that it is. So um, we're still in the process of trying to figure out a spot that works for the scouts, that works for police, fire, location of a porta party, that sort of thing. So we'd obviously be cognizant of neighbors, different different locations, the access to it, things like that. But but that's where we're where we're at with this. All right. Thank you, Frank. Um, does the board have any questions, comments? Ms. Karn? Thanks, Frank. Um, coming off of the uh, Eagle Scout ceremony this weekend, 
and seeing the importance and the life lessons that these kids learn just by spending time and with one another and camping. I think it's really important for them to have this opportunity and time in, in town. Um, and I know there are a lot of, I, there's a lot, there are a lot of details to shake out. So I'm not suggesting that, you know, we approve this tonight, but I certainly am in favor of, of going forward and exploring it a little bit more. Um, you know, COVID prevented them from camping and, you know, sometimes little kids, right, they need, they need an experience that's more local. So I think we've got, what, eight, what is it, 800, 800 acre, I don't know, acres, yeah, yeah, yeah. of, of conservation question. land. I, I'm sure we can find a piece that we can responsibly carve out for these kids. Um, what I would like to see is, A, get it in writing from the CR holder that this is permissible, because I think there's some concern by, um, you know, some folks that have raised issues, you know, Mr. Kinahan is here as well, um, about it evolving into something different. And I don't think that'll ever happen, but I think if we do our due diligence and make sure we clearly map out um, what's entailed with this camping ground that we can protect it from being something anything than what the intention is um, on behalf of Frank and, and, uh, and Troop 7. Um, I would like to see a map of the land that um, Frank and Nico, you know, where you ultimately um, determine is a good spot. Um, so I think that's important too for all of us to understand exactly where that's going to be. Um, I, Frank and I did talk and I did raise an issue when he said it was sort of on the corner of the Rod and Gud Club, you know, my, my antennas went right up. Um, knowing what happened years ago, um, I, I forget, what is that Heritage Trail over there? Is that the name of that road um, where Gary Myerson used to live? So I just wanna make sure that whatever location it is that they, these kids are absolutely free from anything that may, um, <laughs> end up in that area, we certainly wanna make sure they're safe, right? So, um, but I am in support of the initiative. I just think we need some more detail. Okay. Um, I, 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 can, I could easily get you the, the email or, or another or a letter from Wildlands, but we do have an email from um, Scott McFadden uh, who we've been dealing with. Yeah, and with. I don't doubt it. I just think it should be part of the whole package, Frank, right? That we keep sure. it all together, yeah. Yep. And I, I, once we we figure out a, a spot or two, we would certainly come back to to the um, select board and see, get your thoughts on that for sure. And, and we we do we all obviously we all want to do it safely. There's a lot of different um, concerns. Like I say again, from depending on who you're talking to, be it board of health or the fire or the police. So we want to try to work all those things through as well as as well as the scouts and their criteria for setting up a safe um, site as well. Any members of the board? Other members? Uh, Mr. Goodrich, please. I just wanna, I guess, echo some of those comments. I mean, I think philosophically having, you know, these kids having access, uh, we can absolutely find a, a space somewhere and, and make sure that, as we said, the safety issues and the all any of those issues can be addressed. I know. I mean, there's campsites across the country. We can overcome these. Um, I, I think as quickly as possible. But again, I'd love to. I'd love to actually physically see. You know, I'd love to even go there to see exactly where those those spots are. Um, and you know, access is key as well. And I know there could be some concern from folks that. Uh, these are on, you know, we shouldn't be on, you know, unaltering some of these pristine type of um, trails. I will say with, you know, personally working with folks and seeing, you know, people who have the disability community, for them to be able to have access sometimes these campsites and we have to alter it to make sure that you can get some of these kids in that may have a problem having access to a really good campsite. Uh, is life changing, and um, you know I, I think it's important that we give those kids a chance to to experience what other kids can. So um, I think we can certainly make something work. All right, 
the board, please, first. I'll, I'll recognize everyone else after the board has had a chance. Uh, Mr. Vignani? Yeah, just a, a, a quick comment. I, I agree with everything the board uh, is saying. I guess on the other side of it, the concern is really the maintenance of the facility. And is it going to be used at other times by other groups that may not be as cautious and as, as, uh, as, as careful as you know, the Boy Scouts that, that may be using it. So um, I, think, I think it has a lot of benefits and I think those are kind of the concerns that we don't want it to, to deteriorate the, the great land that we have. We want it to be maintained and we don't want it to be um, you know, the place that, that people don't want to hang out for, for other reasons. Um, so, uh, you know, Frank, as you, as you kind of pull the whole proposal together, if you could just have those thoughts and kind of responses to that, would be great. Okay. Uh, Ms. Canfield? I haven't done this for a year and a half. <laughs> um, Frank, um, this is Karen. I, um, yeah, I think that, you know, the, the proposed camping use has always been discussed. It's a permission, I, I, I think it will be confirmed that it is a permissible activity. All of those things are fine, um, but I don't think it's ready for prime time by a long stretch because I have, I personally have a lot of concerns about a permanent structure because if the, you know, if the scouts are using it, as Tony sort of alluded to, the scouts are using it for 20 days a week. I'm pretty sure I know what's gonna happen the rest of the year. And we need to make sure that, you know, we're not setting up a problem. So those things have to be fleshed out um, and it's safe for the community. Um, you know, if there's 40 people over night, I think you're right, the whole, the whole restroom facility has to be a, a good plan. So wherever it ends up, you got to make sure that you can get porta potties in or whatever it is. But you know, it, it's not quite ready, but um, it is permissible under the under the. Um, and we have a lot of land, but I think you need to really drill down on those concerns. And and I think you know we'll hear soon. We did get some pushback from residents who don't think it's a good idea at all. So um, I think. That was, that's my two cents. Well, and if, if I could just add that um, perhaps after we've been through all these permitting of various events and licenses, et cetera, there should be some sort of a permitting process to use the campground um, if, if that's what it becomes so that we have some control over who's out there, who's responsible, who's the responsible adult, do they have the right insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I'm in agreement with everyone. I think it's absolutely permissible, depend, you know, on, on our conservation land, but it has to be done carefully. So um, I will just, unless anyone else on the board has anything to say, I'll wrap up. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, ahead. I'll just say. I mean, so I mean, let's we let's be honest about what we're talking about. We're, we're fearful of their kids out drinking in the woods or other extracurricular activities. There's lots of other different technologies, thermal imaging and other things that we can do to make sure that no one is out there, that a lot of other campgrounds that we can at a very low cost, make sure that we have some sort of eyes and ears on the ground um, to make sure that we're not causing a, uh, an unintended uh, party scene, uh, so to speak for, for other times. So I, I totally am with and understand those concerns, but I also, we respectfully, I, I don't want us to stop doing things just because there are some bad apples. I think we can find ways around the bad apples, but that's just my two cents. All right. So from the audience, any raised hands? Yes, and you are. I'm sorry, can't tell who you are. Is it Mr. Is it Mr. Ken Kenahan? Hello. Uh, yes, Mike Kenahan. Thank you. Right. And um, your, your address. Your address for the record, please. I'm 287 Tilden Road, Situate, Mass. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak and I appreciate all the work that the select board does for behalf of the town. So thank you as a resident. And, and yes, I did um, send a letter and I have spoken with uh, Mr. Snow uh, just recently. And, and my concern, both as a resident and as the president of the Situate Ron Gun Club, uh, is really just 
uh, I wanted to make sure that, you know, this seems to have come across the, the bow fast and furious and uh, wanted to make sure that uh, as both an abutter and also as a resident um, that we would, uh, you know, address this thoughtfully and it appears that the board is going to do so and, and require further investigation. So thank you for that. A um, couple of quick comments. The Citrus Run Gun Club is not opposed to scouting at all. In fact, the club has offered many programs for scouts who have allowed scouts to camp on our land. We've allowed uh, many, uh, you know, shooting gun safety, uh, things like that to, to, to occur on our premises. And we've, we've always been, been welcoming, welcoming to the scouts. Um, Mr. Goodrich mentioned, uh, you know, other uh, special needs type of people and, and access to property. You know, please be aware that, you know, the, the Rod and Gun Club does a fishing derby every year. We do a number of other things, but part of the fishing derby, we have a special fishing derby for the life skills kids, which is uh, a very gratifying event that, you know, my wife uh, and I and, and, and men, many members of the club uh, participate in where we take the situate life skills kids and, and we provide them with a day of fishing. We stock the pond, we get lunch served them, uh, known as ice cream. And frankly, it's the highlight of their, their year. So the club is, is very, you know, community focused and, and we're certainly not ever, you know, wanting to, you know, be aloof or uh, exclusive. Uh, we're very welcoming. Um, you know, I think Mrs. Uh, Canfield made a very good point, uh, you know, that, that we are concerned as, as butters that you know, the property will be used by many other people that are not going to be scouts, uh, potentially bad actors. Look, we've all been kids and done things we probably shouldn't. And there'll be kids in this town that will continue to do that. So, you know, as an abutter, we're very concerned about those things. Um, we're also, you know, concerned with the, the proposal was to, to access this land across our property. Um, and, you know, there, there's a number of streams that, that cross our property and uh, we're not sure, you know, bringing porta potty trucks and, and, and the like, um, you know, is, is really advisable, um, you know, from a conservation standpoint, uh, you're going over wetlands and the like. Um, and I do understand that the conservation land can be used for, for various uh, purposes. Um, and people have made that comment, but my understanding is that, that conservation land can't be designated for the sole use of one group. So it wouldn't be necessarily um, solely uh, used by the scouts. So the Brownies could use it, the Girl Scouts, you know, the you know, situate bird watchers. I mean, it could be any number of, of participants, I think, that would also have the right to use this facility. So, you know, I think it would also be used quite often. Um, and again, I don't want to, you know, ramble on and on and on. I mean, again, we're, we're not opposed to having, you know, the scouts have access to, to, to some parts of conservation land, but, but be aware that there are people that shoot in Cohasset on their own property and the proposed, uh, site from what I understand, um, is potentially in the line of, of people that are shooting. Now, I don't know their facility. They are legally shooting. They, they do have 500 feet between residents. Uh, but I can tell you that the Citrus Run Gun Club has the police show up at our door quite often saying, hey, we hear you're shooting high-powered rifles. And it's not the case. It's those, those shots are not coming from us. They're coming from people that are shooting in Cohasset on adjacent property. And so we want to also make sure that where this place is going to be located uh, is in a place that is going to be very safe. And if there is any kind of fire that, you know, the Rod and Gun Club does not get blamed for any, you know, uh, you know, God forbid anything would happen, but we don't want to be blamed for it if it does. And, and so I think that, you know, as I, I reached out to Mr. Snow and said that he can come talk to the Situate E-Board, uh, Rod and Gun Club E-Board, we can bring maps and, and we can talk about other things, uh, other locations on the conservation land that do not abut our property and see if there's a, a more suitable location. So again, I'm, I'm you know, not really a fan of building anything on conservation land. I understand it can be done, but as a resident, I don't really like that concept. Uh, as a member of the Rod and Gun Club, we have been supportive and, and will continue to support the scouts to the extent that we can, but we think this really needs to be vetted uh, at a very, very high level. And if this is going to abut our property, there's a number of concerns. Uh, we take firearm safety extremely, extremely seriously and, and don't want any kind of, uh, you know, trespassers or, you know, kids drinking beer at this, you know, this site coming across on our property and, and damaging our ranges or picking up, 
you know, spent brass or any of those things. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful about this. Um, so I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Mr. Kinahan. I think that, you know, clearly, um, if I could express, I think the board is saying more work needs to be done on this. And I think that continuing conversations with Mr. Snow and the Conservation Commission are warranted. Um, does anyone else want to say anything? Karen, can I just explain a couple of quick of things? Course. I know of you've course. got other things on your agenda. Um, so no, yes. First off, the, the Run Gun Club site was one of several that we considered. So, and it was brought up through discussions with different different folks and it's just one of many. And certainly we wouldn't just do anything. That's why we're going through this whole process. So um, we have lots of property and as it's been pointed out, we're going to look at a few different locations and come up with one that, that seems best. You know, one of the best things about discussing this with, with a number of people is Andrew's piece on, on accessibility because I'm not so sure the scouts have given that as much thought as they probably should and, and it should be part of that I think that when what we're trying to in my vision is trying to create a fairly primitive site this isn't going to be a really built up site one of the reasons that they promoted 10 platforms is because the scouts have a whole set of criteria and one of them is that platforms make it safer for the tents and whatnot if there's a lightning storm. You know, I, everybody's got their little glitch as to what makes things safer, but that was the reason for the platform. So a bunch of these things can be talked about, but the idea is not to create a campground, but an area that's usable for camping. But yeah, everyone's absolutely right. This won't be exclusive to the scouts and other people could come to the commission and request the use of this. It would be by permission only do our best to um, make sure that the properties aren't abused and, and the, the town, the, the police department has been good enough to, to appoint um, Craig Keefe um, as one of the officers that's doing a great job. And I think we've had a lot less issues out on, on our property with, with the added effort of the Citro Police Department. So I'm, I'd like to think that we aren't gonna have huge issues with that, but. But that's the goal. It's not a. It's not a permanent. It's not a, a, a campground that's going to be run all the time. But it will give the scouts a chance to have maybe some shakedown camping, and if maybe someday there's an outing group at the high school or, like you say, Girl Scouts, whatever, we could we could consider that. But and it would absolutely be by per permission. Um, so, but we'll we'll get to work on some of these issues that were raised for sure. All right. And I can also just say, and luckily, as, as um, Morris so, so spoke of with the Eagle piece on Saturday, I was with about 20 scouts, leaders and parents, and they planted about a thousand plugs of seagrass on Jericho Beach, along with stakes and stuff. So it's nice to see the help that we get from these groups. And, and we're going to do our best to be um, reciprocal. Very good. Anybody else? Anyone in the audience? No? So um, I'm not sure we have to vote on this. Does anyone think we do have to vote on it? So no, I don't think there's anything so, to vote on. So what right. So so Frank, I think what you're probably hearing from us is much as we sent you back with the community garden proposal to flesh out the details, show us exactly where. You, um, you choose and if there are members of the board who would like to be taken on an expedition to look at the site, perhaps you would offer us that opportunity, those of you who go in the woods, which I do not. So <laughs> I would rely on, <laughs> I camp out at the Ritz folks. So um, if anyone would um, you know, like to have input on this, we'd appreciate it. And we do appreciate the, the interest that all the people in town have in conservation land. And, um, but I think when we started investing in it, it was to make it for everyone, not just for certain people. So um, I thank everyone. I thank Frank for coming forth with this. And if there are no other questions or comments, we can move on. Thank All you. Right. For thank you. All right. So now we're on to ratification of a temporary extension of premise for Widow's Walk and Jim Boudreau, the town administrator will address this. 
Jim? So very simply, the board's aware the Widow's Walk Clubhouse is under construction, so we have no food services at Widow's Walk. We had sent out an RFP looking to see if we could get some uh, food trucks to go up there and provide food services. We were unsuccessful. Uh, we were lucky to find simply good catering. They have set up a tent out there where they would be serving food and beverages for the golfers at Widow's Walk. So I have given them their temporary permit, and now the board needs to ratify that. So, Jim, the food people have gone from being desperate to being overwhelmed, I guess. I haven't been up there, but I've heard good things. I haven't been up yeah. there since they set up, but I've heard good things. And, and just yeah. to have something uh, for people to eat, have water and, and beverages, I think is important, especially right. in this weather. Um, any questions from the board? All right. I have one question about the 8 a.m. start for alcohol. Seems kind of early. But I guess if you've already gone to church at seven, it's okay. <laughs> no um, one else, no, everyone, they, everyone seems to think it's okay to drink if you're golfing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, they are anyways. Need it. If you yeah, the parking lot, <laughs> since, <laughs> since they've been closed, they are anyways. Um, I'm not sure they're serving alcohol that early, but they are open that early. They probably oh. need it just to get ready and prepared when they all go out for their tournaments. And they'll have breakfast sandwiches and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Just Ms. Did you want to concur on that? <laughs> um, no, I, I've never tried qualifying golf. <laughs> I actually understand Michael has quite a handicap. Yeah, me. <laughs> no, no, a good one. <laughs> At any rate, do I hear a motion? Such a card tonight, Mr. Vignani. <laughs> I move the board of select and ratify the temporary license issued by the town administrator to Wittiswell Golf Course and simply good catering to serve wine and malt under a temporary extension of the premises and outdoor seating license in accordance with COVID-19 order number 35 and consistent with the process of approving such requests established by the select board. Do I hear a second? Second by Ms. Canfield. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conlon. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries five zero. Just on one more thing, real quick, Madam yes. Chair. Uh, yes. The golf course is doing a phenomenal business right now. I know people are really happy with Ian, the job he's doing. Um, probably the next meeting of the meeting after that, Nancy and I will give you an idea. But uh, we are well past our estimated receipts for fiscal twenty one. We're going to blow way past that. So the the golf course will have a nice retained earnings number at the end of this fiscal year. It's good to hear. Good. I'm glad to see it looks like the construction started as well. Yeah. yeah. Great. Can't Let's hope see the good weather continues. All right. On to the next item. Um, this is to discuss and vote rescission of the emergency order effective June 15th, 2021. Mr. Boudreaux. You know, very simply, we put an executive order for an emergency declaration with the pandemic to match the governor's um, the governor's emergency order is expiring on the 15th. Um, I really don't see the need to continue the emergency declaration on the part of the Board of Selectmen beyond that date. All right. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Canfield? Uh, so we can rescind this, and if it's extended by the legislature, then it's moot? Is that how it works? You mean the... Um, the open meeting law? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we are not uh, operating under remote rules by the emergency declaration of the Board of Selectmen. We're doing that on the emergency declaration of the governor. Our emergency declaration would have no authority to override that statute in the open meeting law. Um, so the governor has filed legislation to codify that change, at least until April 2022. So uh, our emergency law really has no bearing on that either way. I get it. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right. No other questions, comments? All right. Do I hear a motion, please? Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to rescind the state of emergency declaration of March 17, 2020. Thank you. Can we Mr. just add effective June 15, 2021? I'm sorry, it wasn't typed in there. Say that again? The, the, the vote is effective June 15, 2021. Can you just... So a motion. So moved. Second. Second by Ms. Canfield. This requires a roll call vote. 
Ms. Conley? Yes. Um, sorry, Ms. Canfield? Yes. Mr. Goodrich? Yes. Ms. Curran? Yes. Mr. Vignani? Yes. Motion carries 5-0, thank you. All right. Did I skip, oh, no, I didn't skip it. Okay, the main event, it's Nancy Holt. We have discussed vote, DPW rates, transfer station rates, water rates, sewer rates. And I will, I think, mention that it seems like we just did this and it's somewhat true that we just did it, but that was because we were late in getting these done, if I recall, because of the pandemic. So we are here now to talk about what happens effective July 1st, 2021. Is that right? That's correct. We normally vote um, over the summer, so it'll be effective for the second quarter. Uh, in this case, the sewer enterprise fund, their fiscal 22 budget requires a, a rate increase in order for them to be solvent. So that's why we're taking this discussion earlier. And we were on your agenda for um, two meetings ago, but it didn't work out. Right. So we're, we're back. And um, none of us expect, uh, Kevin, Sean, Sean, myself, or Will, expect this to be a one meeting vote. Um, we expect it to go over several meetings. Uh, you can always surprise us, but we're, we're not expecting that. I would expect that this particular presentation to you from the three different enterprise funds uh, we'll just come back with comments and requests from the board about additional information that they require, and then we'll move forward at the following meeting and any meetings, subsequent meetings after that. Uh, Madam okay. Chair, do you want me to share my screen, or do you just want to follow along with your packet? Well, I think I think you, you could share your screen, but let me clear on this. Um, do you need a vote on sewer tonight, or... No, you still have one more meeting in June, and right. also they will not bill the first bill until the end of July, so we also right. have meetings in July. All right, so there's no pressing need tonight to vote on anything, but we should have the information and be able to ask the questions tonight. All right, very good. Um, I, I guess I just have a, a point of order here, whether or not we want to let Nancy or Kevin or all of our experts um, get through their presentation first and then we can ask questions. Is that all right with everyone? Sure. All right, okay, very good. And I think she should share her screen so the public yes. can oh, see. I, yeah, I said that, yes. Oh, I, sorry, I didn't hear That's it. all right, yeah. Yes, please share your screen, Nancy. I will let you know that I am having technical difficulties tonight and occasionally freeze. So if that happens, we'll have Seth come in and just kill me. Um, no. <laughs> virtually speaking. Yeah, no, no, no. No, help you. <laughs> All right. Screen sharing. There you yeah, go. All I right. We're up on transfer station rates. Okay, very uh, good. So uh, just as a spoiler alert, we are not requesting any rate changes in the transfer station. So rather than go through 10 slides and regale so you with all, yeah, <laughs> with all of our information, <laughs> I'm just going to hunt and peck a couple of slides for you. Um, just uh, to highlight a couple of things so the board will know when it comes forward to you again. So let me just put this into uh, presentation mode. So okay. the reason why you might consider a, a transfer station rate increase later on in fiscal 22, um, or for reasons you were already well aware of, we're having a decrease in the revenues from recyclables. Um, unfortunately, the disposal costs are not decreasing. They are only increasing as was evidenced by the April special town meeting vote to add $110,000 to the fiscal 21 budget uh, hauling costs. Um, already this year, we've spent $744,000 in hauling costs and we still have about six weeks left of uh, bills to process. And another item for the transfer station enterprise is a need for investment in equipment. So the yard jockey was already approved, it's on order. Or soon to be on order. They also have um, a loader that was approved in April and they're, they also need an excavator and truck and security improvements that are on the capital plan. So those equipment needs will need to be addressed whether we do debt service or whether we do an outright purchase. And that will have to be reflected in the rates uh, if nothing else changes with the hauling costs. So um, just a quick, the hauling costs of the last five years, as you can see, double digit increases uh, with no end in sight. Uh, these are the different uh, hauling cost providers, uh, just so you have a feel of where our costs are. The number two, the two biggest are CMAS for household trash, uh, which is just over about $104 per ton, and then New England Recycling for uh, construction demolition debris, which is $110 per ton, which is uh, the second highest. Uh, 
what we have concern of that we may be back to you, we'll probably be back before the select board later in fiscal 22, is that the construction and demolition debris with New England recycling contract expires in November. Um, and that has been held at $110 per ton for three years. So it is likely it is going to go um, higher. And if that is the case, we would come back before the board barring any other changes for some type of proportional increase in the C&D rate uh, and poten potentially in some of the other um, uh, bulky waste rates. Any type of a sticker increase, if it were to be considered, would be something that we would do on a probably on a calendar basis because everyone has purchased their stickers already. Uh, but that's just kind of a spoiler of what could come if the New England recycling contract uh, doesn't do well. Uh, year to date, the enterprise fund is up about $70,000 in revenue over, the, um, over its projected amount. But keep in mind, we added $110,000, so we still need to take in another $40,000 in revenue to be self-supporting. And as we previously noted, we had some skew in our revenue for the stickers because we weren't enforcing stickers at, uh, when the pandemic struck in the spring of 2020. So some of that sticker revenue came into fiscal 21. Uh, so that, that's our concern. Good news is that we're not gonna need to have a revenue deficit. Um, bad news is we do have some skew from the stickers and we did have to, have to add $110,000 to the budget. So we still wanna make that up to make sure that we're self-supporting. So barring any questions from the select board, I'll stop the transfer station um, presentation and move on to the sewer rate presentation. Any questions, anyone? Yes, Ms. Canfield? Uh, just very quickly, Nancy, um, thank you for, for drilling this all down because it's, it's such a situation and the fact that we're not in the hole is great. Um, Anecdotally, I think I have a question. I think Kevin's still here somewhere. We're all we're all on weird screens now. But um, have you had to turn like I don't know. Random question: Do you ever have to turn away haulers that you're you know quote unquote full um, at the station? Like you, your capacity is maxed because of the limitations of where stuff can go. All I heard was. Oh. I think that's Kevin Cafferty. Kevin, we do. <laughs> I can't see him. John is also on the call, and he could probably address it. Sorry, can't see you either. Oh, I see him now. Yep. All right, Kevin. No, we typically don't turn away haulers. We bring we bring everybody in that's bringing material in and, and dispose of it. Okay. So Provided was, it meets our criteria and guidelines for what we can handle. Okay. I, I only bring that up because I got a, a surprising um, notice today from one of the private haulers who has delayed pickup in Situate today because they had no place to take their stuff because everyone was full. And I've never heard of that before. Have you heard? Like, is that like a thing? So they said it was full at the station? I don't, they didn't specify where they dispose of their stuff, but they said that they were no longer that today was at capacity and they couldn't pick any more trucks up. It might have been their capacity because to my knowledge, we've taken everything unless we've been turning around a trailer or something to that effect. Sean, did you hear anything about that? I, as far as I know, we've always been able to take it. And if not, we stack it up, process it, and then dispose of it in the dumpsters. Yeah, we haven't had a problem with any of our vendors handling what we've been taking in. If it's I know the, it, it, it's it completely shocked me because I've never heard of such a thing. So that's why I thought I'd just run it by you guys because you know. Okay. It did happen when the only glass recycler um, went out of business a year and a half ago. Um, yeah. That left the whole east coast here of Massachusetts scrambling to find a place to put it. No, um, this was a private hauler who delayed pickup. You know, normal Tuesday pickups uh, a day because they were, they informed their residents that they um, were full. Like they did have nowhere to take it. So they might be taking it down to the Braintree yard. There's a there's a disposal place down in Braintree, and they might have had issues down there that that prevented them from taking it. But that's separate from how we handle it. Great, thank you. I just was Mr. Mr. Goodrich. On the the construction and debris uh, fees, it looks like we're <clears> at two forty. Where, which is the lowest compared to Marshfield. So is that when 
like they weigh your weigh the truck and you you pay the fee from there or is that just a special 240 for construction or is that i mean just when this i'm sorry that's when the trucks go over the scale it's based on 240 pounds uh 240 dollars you know per ton for 2,000 pounds so if somebody goes over with a 300 pound couch or, or a you know a trailer load of material whatever that comes out to that's the rate so all right and so that having to raise that hey my kids love it when we have to go on that that's awesome um, <laughs> but it just seems so much lower than all the other and that would that be the place that we'd have that we may have to pull the lever to yep. raise if we had to for those costs going forward potentially and it's also where um when I was doing the comparison between different communities, we saw other communities had raised their rates. So before when we raised our rates on C and D, we were probably the second highest around. And now others have raised their rates who were second lowest. Are the, so are those mostly residents do that or is that mostly commercial folks? Combination. Well, combo. Yeah, especially when you come in with uh, material unsorted, so to speak. Um, sometimes they come in and we let them get rid of their metal um, because there's no charge for that. And then we put them on the scale and then they dispose of the stuff that they've jumbled together. Um, so they're only paying for really what is unsorted. Yeah. 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 I was just trying to figure out where the impact might be on the commercial side. Or okay. That's helpful. Thank you. All right. Yes, Ms. Karin. Uh, Ms. Karin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, so this is just Kevin and, and uh, Sean. Couple, two questions. Are the laws for recycling different in Rhode Island than they are in Massachusetts? And the only reason why I ask is because I've been to some of their transfer <clears throat> stations, quote unquote, down there. And they have, um, they don't have to separate as much. And they have, you know, fewer amount of compactors. And I'm just wondering if there's anything that's preventing us from looking at a different solution, since we seem to be getting to a, a point where we're having difficulty, you know, our, our costs are rising because we there's no place for the stuff to go, right? So is there a different way in which our recycling could be addressed and looked at? I, I think everything's different in Rhode Island, but you know, they are they're subject to Rhode Island DEP, but we're subject to Mass DEP standards, so they're two different sets of standards. Um, and the thing to remember with our recycling, it's not costing us money. I, I always look at it as it's saving us money because instead of paying to dispose of it, we're actually paying a lot less than what our rate would be for trash, if that makes sense. So it, it, costs, it costs less for the recyclables to be taken away than it costs to have just Jumbled have up it added trash. into the household trash. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I'm, so, and I'm so not few years suggesting ago. that we not have recycling. I, I was just curious. They they don't have to separate it as much. So their recyclables are um, commingled much more than ours are. Um, I guess that's the term we use there. Um, so I was so, just curious. So we could commingle. We could commingle our recycling to different levels, but it would not be worth as much because we break our recycling down to different levels and take all the material out and separate it, it's worth more. So even though we might be paying, and I'll just pull this out of the air, $10 a ton to dispose of it, if we didn't separate it, we might be paying $40 per ton to dispose of it. So we're saving money in that way on how we break it down, if that makes sense. It does, okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, let's move along to, are we going to water rates, Nancy, or? Uh, yes, let's go to water rates. We love water rates. <laughs> Thank you. Want to share your screen? Here we go, hopefully. No, or not. You have to tell me, do you see water rates? No. Okay, so much for that. <laughs> oh, that looks better. Oh, there it is. We got it. <clears throat> It takes a while sometimes and it takes a village. Yeah. So um, there's different rate factor, different considerations driving all of the um, enterprise fund rate considerations. In water specifically, it's the debt service costs for all of the infrastructure improvements. 
Um, as the board and the, the audience is well aware, there are significant capital projects that are, are in the queue for water, including the new treatment plant and additional water main replacement, just to name a couple of things. Um, we'll take a quick look at the five-year plan just so we can see what else is on there. Um, and what we've done over the last few years is focus on what we know and its impact on the current rate, rather than trying to build things into the rate for future costs that we have not voted on yet. So this is the five-year capital plan. Um, the items that are marked as 2022 were items in the 2022 plan that did not move forward and they will automatically roll into 2023. But as you can see, the total plan is valued at $67 million. 40 million of that is the new treatment plant. Um, but there's several things on there, including uh, booster station upgrades, uh, the reservoir expansion, redevelopment of public wells, which is something that needs to go on on a regular basis to keep our wells performing. Um, and then the standpipe uh, design for the standpipe repairs, as well as some of the construction for the uh, standpipe repairs. So what we're looking about looking at right now is the authorized and unissued debt. So we have 3.5 million. Uh, it was originally $4 million that was approved for the engineering and design of the new water treatment plant. We've already issued 500,000 of that and incorporated it in the rates. So there's still 3.5 million out there. Um, there's $800,000 for design and engineering of Hummel Rock, Hummel Rock water mains. We have not moved forward on that project as yet. We've been focusing more on um, the water mains within uh, the mainland part of uh, Situate. Uh, the well 17A green, green sand filter, that was uh, subsidized, not subsidized, was also uh, financed with a Clean Water Trust grant. That project is finishing up. I don't think we're going to need all of the different authorizations we have. So it is possible that $2 million of that authorization can be rescinded at a future town meeting once we finish that project. Um, the 2.7 million for the new water tank that we just approved and the 3.3 million for the Dolan Wellfield construction that was just approved in April. So those are some big ticket items that are sitting out there that are not incorporated in the rates that at some point will be incorporated in the rates once we um, move forward with the projects and start incurring, start incurring costs. Um, so every 1% increase in the race is approximately uh, $61,000 in revenue. Uh, the things that we did not incorporate in our last rate review back in this fall of uh, 2020 that our town meeting approved authorized projects that we have started to spend are on or is the, um, the $4 million that we just talked about, the $800,000. Uh, there was the $350,000 for the permanent residuals. That project has already moved forward. It is under construction right now. We've incurred the cost, borrowed the funds, so that needs to be incorporated in the rate. And then the two others that we also uh, spoke about. So what does our debt look like right now? So 2022 is the year that's going to be starting in July. That's where the debt is uh, positioned with existing long-term debt, the items that have been issued for which we're repaying principal and interest. Uh, the pale pink are the authorized and unissued items that we just reviewed and their impact on the debt service. So as you can see, even though the debt, the hot pink is going down, it's not going down enough to accommodate all of the uh, additional infrastructure uh, debt service costs that we are going to incur. So in fiscal 21, we uh, factored in an additional, uh, just over a million 77,000 in estimated debt service. In actuality, we issued um, two different bonds in fiscal 21. So the actual debt is going up 1.3 million. Uh, that include the $5 million in water mains and the 350,000 for the well 18 permanent residuals. So in order to accommodate that Delta, uh, we're looking at a 3.9% rate increase So that would uh, bring us up to make up the difference for the 237. The other concerns that are something that we should consider is that the town of Marshfield increased its fiscal 21 out of town water rate by 10%. Uh, again, we are still working with the town of Marshfield about communication on these things. The first half bill was $173,000. Our overall budget is $354,000. And actually those bills, I don't know, Kevin, if you remember what they were, they just arrived um, in like the last week. So I believe we're still within budget. I think our fiscal 22 budget is okay, but we do need to be mindful um, that even with the pressure reducing valve that helped control our costs for the town of Marshfield, but until we do anything uh, in regards to maybe a water main replacement project over there, uh, we still have potential loss. So we still have potential costs 
And since we have not been able to deal with the rate increases with them, that's something else that is also we need to be aware of. And I said, Nancy, it's, it's, yeah. is, is our agreement with Marshfield in writing? Our agreement with Marshfield expired many, many years ago, and we need to renew our agreement with Marshfield. Both towns are aware, but it hasn't moved forward. Yeah, I mean, that, that would help with being able to plan properly. That uh, they haven't I'll been very really helpful. Uh, okay, I didn't want to say it, but yeah. It's Kevin what, said. Kevin? It wouldn't be helpful? They, have, they haven't been very helpful. I'm, I'm not trying to sound like that, but we've gone to multiple meetings um, with them, you know, to discuss this and, you know, told them we need to know because we're a town just like they are and we need to budget for it. Right. And, um, yeah. You know, they, you know, we get the same thing. They had been going through their DPW director was going to, he retired. And then they had another DPW director who things seemed to be going well. And then he left and went to Bourne and they brought the guy who had retired back. So we're back where we started from. Um, but he is going to retire someday and hopefully we improve that relationship. So it is, it is something that needs the intermunicipal agreement between the two towns needs to be renewed. Um, there is legislation, actual legislation that allowed us to buy um, water from Marshall, I think it dates from the 30s. It says that they have to discuss the rates with us and we keep applying for abatements and citing the legislation and they keep taking our abatements. Denying and not them. Yeah. No, they're not denying them. They're just not ruling on them. So. It, it, it's an ongoing relationship that needs to be fostered um, for, a be, for a better outcome for both communities. Um, All right. just, just a quick uh, summary of the Marshfield bills, just so you can see, you can see how uh, the, in 2018, we had a water main break because of Riley, we actually had two of them. So that caused the $185,000 uh, specifically jump. And we did get 75% of that reimbursed from uh, FEMA. And the decline has been, a lot has been due to the pressure reducing valve that um, Kevin and his team and Sean uh, installed, which helps control the flow in Hummer Rock. So last year we added a fourth tier for usage and we looked a lot about where um, our usage was and where the, the drop offs were. So I wanted to provide this analysis to you within this presentation and then see what uh, additional information you would like. I could make this presentation like 50 slides long and I like go down tangents and different roads and data analysis and then have to back away. So this is where I'm gonna need the board's direction on where um, other areas they wanna look at. Um, one of the problems we had is because uh, when we voted that fourth tier, which was in uh, October of last year and the usage, we don't have a full year worth of usage and we don't have the high periods, which would have been the summer to really see if that fourth tier is affecting people's behavior or if it will. Um, but I did want to break it out to you right now based on um, there doesn't seem to be any effect. It, it looks about the same. It's about 40% in the first one. If you look down at the bottom, it was 0.3, now it's 0.2. That could be because we don't have enough information and people really haven't felt the burden on their pocketbook for that high use behavior, or it could be the high use behavior isn't impacted by a rate. So it's, it's something to consider. We don't have enough data to... Um, draw any conclusions, but I do want to provide this at the um, thousand uh, cubic feet breakout, just so you can see it a little bit better. And on the first column indicates what tier someone is in once they, they uh, go over that threshold. So the bottom, almost over half of this is in that more expensive tier four. And as you can see, there really is no drop off, but again, we don't have enough data to really judge. Um, so the rate summary that we want to go over is the things that are not uh, yet included in the rates because they had not yet been borrowed is the remainder of that uh, design and engineering, the design and engineering for Hummer Rock water mains and the two major projects that were just approved in April. Again, we have 67 million on the capital plan, the $40 million water treatment plant fast moving up and I'm sure that design contract will be before the board shortly for their approval. So the big question is, what have the water rate increases been in the past? And this is the last uh, approximately 10 years. And then the, the type of increase and what it was used for. So last year, we, the rates were voted to be increased by 11%, the base and the usage. And then we added a fourth tier of usage for over 5,000 cubic feet. 
um, and that covered the $5 million water mains and the $500,000 in plant design. So what is the recommendation? If right now, uh, until we have further discussion on it, the recommendation that we come back to you with is for that 3.9% to make up the Delta and the debt service of the uh, just over 200,000. Um, the rate increase will address specifically the debt service, which is addressing the infrastructure needs of the system. Uh, the other thing we need the board to consider and come back with is the pursuit of other capital projects to reduce expense costs, because that's one of the things we look at is how can we increase revenues, how can we decrease expense expenses overall, and that would be potentially moving up the Hummel Rock Water Main Replacer Project and getting it out for design. Um, you know, it's not like um, Sean, Sean, and Kevin don't need something else to do. They've only they're, they're only running about twelve different projects right now, but. Uh, the prioritization of that project needs to be discussed at some point as to um, whether we kick the can down the road a few more years or whether we uh, try to move that up as the next phase of water main replacement after the, the two that we're working on. And then looking at the different financing for the remaining infrastructure improvements, such as ARPA funds. What will the ARPA funds bring? But not only ARPA funds, if you recall um, the ARA funds, you may not recall them, I recall them from 2008. Uh, the the, the uh, recession of that period, there were a lot of financing tools that became available, um, different types of bonds uh, that would make some of what we're trying to do in the investment in the infrastructure with water and probably sewer more attractive. So that's something we'll look at in the drinking water funds uh, that the state has, their state revolving fund, which is what is financing the green sand filter right now. Um, that's something that may be a useful tool for us for the water treatment plant specifically. Uh, it used to sometimes provide grants as well as low interest loans. So right now a 2% loan from them is not that attractive. We can do, probably do better on the marketplace ourselves. But if that was paired with say uh, a million dollar grant, it looks very attractive. So those are just some things to think about as we talk about um, in the future, how to finance the 67 million that's on the capital plan. So what does our water bill look like as compared to other water bills in the area? Well, Cohasset um, is still, leading the charge with the highest water bill around. Um, Hingham, the town that I live in, it's a little hard to say since Hingham decided to buy out um, aquarium water and buy their own water system. Uh, it doesn't look like the rates have changed. Uh, so I'm expecting that to remain in the number two slot. Uh, we are in the number three slot, which isn't surprising considering the type of uh, investment that we have made in our uh, infrastructure over the last uh, three to five years. This 3.9% increase would mean about a $25 increase on a um, 7,500 cubic feet bill. And I think last time we checked that we're, the average user is slightly below that, but it's just so you can compare apples to oranges across all the different communities. Um, several communities did change their rates recently. Uh, Marshfield and Rockland both increased their rates, but there are some communities that have done nothing for many years like Kingston. So either they're not in, um, investing in their infrastructure and they're going to have the same problem that we had when all of a sudden you have to make a major infrastructure investment and you haven't done anything, you have nothing to work with, um, or they just have a wonderful infrastructure and don't need to make any investments. So that's why I add that comment, just so you can see the last time that those rates were revised. And that is the last slide. And if I'm willing to take uh, any comments, I know that Sean, Sean and Kevin are also willing to take any comments and direction at this time. And I'll just stop sharing that so we can see each other. All right, so I see who's hand up from the board. Andrew Goodrich, please. I think you- I'm still you're... marinating on it. I, my hand is <laughs> Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Benyani. Yeah, I'll kind of start the conversation now. Um, Nancy, in the graph that you had down here of the, the dark pink and then the light pink, and you said the light pink is the authorized stuff, that, that does not include the $67 million of expected long, longer term expenses, right? That's correct. Is any of this on here? Any of the 67 million? No, because none of it's approved yet. So none of this is authorized. Right? Correct. So I'll, I'll go back to the, uh, Andrew brought this up on an earlier conversation. So when I first started 
doing this selectman stuff, we were Kingston. We were the ninth and 10th water rates in on that list. And now we are, you know, the second, third level, and we have $67 million worth of infrastructure that we have to put into the system over the next, what would you say, it's five, 10 years? Yes. No. Yeah. So, so uh, probably about five or six years ago, when you saw those increases, we have the expectation of increasing our rates at least 10% a year every year. Um, we did expedite it to 20% for a three year stretch when we told Kevin, do whatever you can do to get those, get those uh, pipes out, those 100 year old pipes. And during that three year stretch, we doubled it. But um, I, I think we kind of have to hold true to what our expectation was of increasing it about 10% a year and, and getting this stuff done. Um, otherwise, we're going to have a huge spike later. You know, in five years, we're going to have, you know, some crazy number that, that's going to knock people off their socks. So, um, you know, I think 3.9 is the minimum that Nancy needs just to cover the debt that's out there now. But, um, you know, I, I think the expectation should be some sort of leveling of the fees and expecting that the increase about 10% a year as these bigger projects come through and they're going to hit our, they're going to hit our, uh, our P&L. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vagnani. Anyone else want to add? Ask questions? Yes, Ms. Canfield? Is that subtle enough? So I, to clarify, I mean, just a little bit of what Tony was saying. I thought last year and the year before, we had, when we did this exercise and figured out, you know, uh, we wanted to make it as, as least painful as possible because we were making all these investments. I, my recollection was that we were anticipating costs. And what I think I'm seeing here is in cost increases are based on things we've committed to, not on projections. Is, am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. We, the last probably two to three years, we focused on just what had been approved and the actual impact because the impact was so great. Okay. Um, well, that's concerning for sure. <laughs> um, I would just to the chair say that we might want to put at the front burner, um, putting together um, an inter-municipal agreement task force or something to address the whole Humrock situation. Because we obviously are completely at their mercy right now. And that does not sit well with me and I'm sure Nancy's projections. Um, well, if, if I could add to that discussion, um, the, the water rates we're paying down in Marshfield are commercial rates, correct? An out of town rate. So it's different oh. from the commercial and different from oh. the residential. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because, because it's, 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 conversation. It just seemed to me as though we could rally the Marshfield commercial user <laughs> base to mm -hmm. ask them to, to please not increase their commercial. But if it, if there's a special out of town rate, that's it, are they giving what are they supplying water to anyone but Hummer Rock? They also supply to Pembroke. Okay. So Duxbury mm -hmm. as well. Duxbury okay. also. Well. I don't know that other, I don't know that we have enough, um, I, I don't know what the word is, influence. I don't think that, unless Marshfield, uh, unless Duxbury and Pembroke would like to help make our case with us. Do they have any interest we, in it? We need, to, we need to hammer out an agreement so that we can do some sound financial planning. Well, I just don't so know why they, they would, right I don't know why, I don't know why Marshfield would agree to do anything other than what they want. You tell me. I think they, you've seen the crux of the problem. They don't have to sign an agreement with us at all. No, they don't, but we need to have a conversation. Well, it sounds like there have been conversations. Kevin, where does that stand? There's been multiple conversations with them and we brought it up a couple times. Um, we have huge water losses down in Humrock 
you know, we've got very old pipes. The reason I, you know, Sean and I have talked about this multiple times, if we pull the trigger on replacing all the water lines in Humrock, which will drastically reduce our water usage down there, um, that'll take all our pipe replacement money down in Humrock probably for the next two to three years. And we didn't want to abandon um, Situate proper and not continue replacing the pipe program that we've been working on. Right. But Madam Chair, may I? Sure, certainly. So sort of Tony's point, right? So if we level out the increases to be a little bit more consistent, are we able to build up some additional cash to take care of that? So we're ultimately reducing our usage costs to Marshfield at a rate that we have zero control over. You can increase your rates to incorporate additional capital, but there, there is not an issue with that at all to expedite some of the projects that you want to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and also how you finance some of the projects, such as like the water treatment plant, whether you finance that through the uh, exclusion override or whether you finance it through the water rates is a discussion that has to be had when that project comes closer to uh, being ready for prime time for a vote. Because uh, I've already done my presentation for that one, so. <laughs> so I've already been having those thoughts about you know the pros and cons of the different ways that that can be financed, and that's uh, you know certainly something that that needs to be discussed by the board as, when they bring that project forward. All right. Anyone else? Kevin, do we have any shared services that Marshfield gets from us? Rock Beach. That came on. Kevin, can't hear you. Kevin, can anyone hear anyone? <laughs> I hear you. Okay. Well, I can hear you. Good. <laughs> That's yeah, all yeah. I care about. <laughs> so the other thing about the Hummer Rock thing, I, I don't want to, um, I know Kevin was stating what he just said, but I don't want it to come across like Hummer Rock is second fiddle. But the reason we did the pipes in proper situations, he said it's because they were 100 years old. Um, so, right. you know, Hummer Rock has to be fixed just as if that's right. the next project that needs to be done. So, um, you know, the fact that it's going to save us water is great, but the pipes need to be fixed. And if it's $61,000 per 1%, you know, that starts us on that project of doing a chunk of Hummer. So, and there may be some opportunities there again with the different like the infrastructure um, program that it's moving its way through Congress at a very uh, slow pace right now. We might see something come out of that that would not only benefit water and sewer types of infrastructure projects, but also there was talk before about FEMA resiliency projects where that addresses both items that could make it a very attractive project, especially where we already have design and engineering money in hand. So um, there, there's just, I, I hate to say it because it really makes me sound really boring, but there's some exciting financial things that could be happening that would help our infrastructure. Nancy, are those grants or loans? It could be both. Hopefully, I, I would want a grant, but I'll take a loan, especially if it's a low interest loan. We can borrow loan. right now at, at peanuts. So we've got to take advantage of the financial markets right now too and, and do our infrastructure when the interest rates are as low as they are. And that's why we have a little bit extra debt service right now is because we did take advantage. Right. And we should continue because I don't think the rates are going to be at 1% for the next couple of decades. No. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Goodrich? Yeah. I mean, I mean, not to, to, to piggyback on what Tony and Nancy said, but I mean, looking at, at the 67 million, I mean, yeah, the, the elephant in the room is the treatment plant and how we're going to finance that versus how those rates are going to go. Um, and I think those, I agree. I think we have to have those conversations now, how that's going to happen. And I think Tony's absolutely right. We're, we may never see these rates ever again. Um, and if there's any, I am, I'm, I'm certainly of mind that if we can take advantage and I don't want to say accelerate all, all that because of that, but it certainly should be part of that discussion because the cost savings are immense long-term. Um, so again, just something else to think about. 
so the question before us tonight is increasing the rates at a minimum of 3.9% or some higher number if we choose to do that. I mean, I guess we don't want to raise the rates just to put it in retained earnings. Um, you know, I guess that's up for Kevin and Sean to say, if we got you another half a million dollars this year, well, can you put it, it put it to good use? Right. If we raised it to 10, that's six extra percent. That's you know, almost $400,000. Can you replace a section of Hummer? Yes, Kevin, you're on mute. You're on mute, Kevin. Kevin. Who knows? And he maybe knows. he doesn't, we don't need the answer tonight. I mean, we're, we're not gonna necessarily vote this tonight, but that's what I'd like to see. Well, I'd I like think, to say, you know, I think, I think I'm he's unmuted, trying to sorry. You. The question was, if we had an extra $500,000, could we put it to effect in Humrock? Yes. Or yeah, we could. A question. Um, any value, you know, anything we could, but it, the, the larger the project we would do, the, the better results we'd get for the unit prices. Um, you know, typically what I do sometimes on that, like the roadways, if, if we were $500,000, we may might wait till we get a million or $2 million and then put it out as a bigger project um, because you'd be, you'd be able to do the main line and then sections of it. We originally planned it to do the north phase and then the south phase of Amrock. But it doesn't have to pay for the whole plan. It can just pay for the financing of the whole plan. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. You could do it that way too, yeah. But you could do the bonded over five years and use that. Yeah, definitely. Purpose. So definitely. I think that's what I'd like to see at the next meeting. What what would be the next projects that you would do that would have a bang for the buck if we were to raise the rates more than Nancy's saying we have to at a minimum? So the Humrock doing Humrock is would be a long-term saver of, of funds because we'd lose a lot of, you know, save some of that water um, that we're being billed at at Marshfield. It wouldn't help the water situation that we had kind of in the mainland. Um, and that's that's the only reason why we've been focusing more on the in-town stuff until we get a lot of that area straightened out. And I can see Karen Canfield saying, before we do that, let's negotiate a rate for the next 20 years <laughs> so we don't produce the water and double the rate. Well, Ms. Canfield, do you want to answer that? <laughs> you know, I'm perfectly happy to have Mr. Vignani. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just was, so recapping what we have been proposed tonight would we result in a $25 a year average increase to residents. And that would cover the things we've already committed to. Is that right, Nancy? Yes, the things that we've already borrowed for that we're incurring debt service costs That's for. just to pay the bills. Yeah. Okay. So $25 yeah. on average, except yeah. for people that put their water on every single night at 3 a.m. And I have no sympathy for them. Okay. And then they'll be in tier four. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, at a minimum, we need to cover our bills. And what we're talking about on the margin is, do we want to accelerate investment by increasing that number? Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Your advice on that? Nancy. Madam, Madam Chair, may I share my screen for just a moment again to show you a slide? that I think might be helpful um, in, based on the comments of the board? Yes. Okay, let's see if this works. <laughs> so these are the projects that are approved that are not incorporated in the rates. So these are the additional debt service costs if we went out to borrow these um, and started working on these projects. So But are those included in the 3.9% projected increase? No, because we haven't borrowed these amounts yet. Got it. These are approved projects, but we haven't incurred any costs yet for them. So if we were to immediately go out and do all, start doing all of these projects and borrow for all of that, you're looking at approximately a 15% increase. 
So these are projects that we know are out there. They're approved. They're going to move forward. The impact on the rate, and that's why on that particular slide, I put the, the debt service on there. Um, so if that's something the board wants to look at, um, at the next meeting, we can come back with, okay, if we, you know, Sean, Sean, and Kevin and I can go sit down and say, these are the projects we reasonably can do in the next 12 to 24 months and complete, because there are spending requirements when you borrow funds, um, and see what that impact would be on the rates if you, if you decided you wanted to move forward and start building in that capital as well. But Nancy, these are in your light pink numbers. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're in the light pink. Yeah. So I, I will ask the question, those numbers are based on sort of more normal circumstances. If Congress actually approves a lot of infrastructure um, projects, uh, it seem, and, and with the supply chain problems that still seem to be out there with building materials, do we think the estimates need to be updated at all to reflect the potential cost increases? The latter two projects, the new water tank, the, specifically the new water tank, that's a, a more recent quote. That would be the one I'd be most concerned about with steel. Yeah. Um, and, but I would defer to Kevin, Sean, and Sean. The construction of the Dolan well field, I'm thinking that's more piping. So again, depending on the type of pipe, I don't know if there are any shortages. The design and engineering of Hummerock, I wouldn't expect there to be a change in price because that's intellectual property. Yeah, but, but, if, again, those, but if those people it's get- It's hard to say, it, Karen. Yeah, well, I'm because just the prices have just been going crazy for everything. Yeah. Our, our pipe suppliers have been telling us that they're just, you know, they're going all over the place. Gravel costs, fuel costs, and in they're fluctuating so much, it's hard to tell what they'll be when when the projects actually come out. They could go up or down. Well, and I even think in the case of design and engineering, you know, <clears throat> if, if people get really busy, they could increase their rates, and so. You know, I would just think that that we'd want to look again at some of these costs just to make sure that, you know, if we're competing for resources countrywide, um, it could be tough. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, Ms. Kenfield. Sorry, I, I hate to belabor this, but to Mr. Vignani, Mr. Goodrich's point, if we we know that there are and just I mean very near term anticipated expenses and capital is very, very inexpensive right now. Is it advantageous to the town to um, incur those expenses now, knowing they're coming short term and incorporate them in the rates that we set now? Does that mean, Mr. Vignani, does that make any sense at all? Yes. <laughs> I just, you know. I don't know. None of us have a crystal ball of what's going to happen, but Mr. Bedreau, what do you think? I mean, if you raise the rates and we don't go forward with the projects, it just ends up building some of our capacity back up in terms of retaining revenue. Um, we still have to finish designing a lot of these projects. So hopefully by the time we get them designed and permitted, uh, the construction market has settled down. Um, you know, I know one of the things that's been talked about with the infrastructure package that the president's talking about is we're not sure that the company, the country has the capacity to produce enough steel to do all this. Um, so, so that could, so, you know, we're hoping 60 bucks from a sheet of plywood is outrageous. It can't continue. Uh, so hopefully by the time you get these projects fully designed and permitted and we're going out to bid um, the construction market would have returned to some level of normalcy. All right. Any other questions, comments? No? All right, thank you, Nancy. Food for thought. On to the next, sewer rates. Okay. okay. Yes. They're coming up. Okay, sewer rates. There we go. So um, as we discussed with the water rates, uh, the items that are driving the sewer rate increases are specifically the debt service for the INI project. Um, and there's, 
like water, there are significant items in the capital pro in the five-year capital plan that will affect debt service, but not as dramatically as in the water enterprise fund. So um, when we were speaking about um, the sewer rate increases in the past, and at one of your recent meetings, we spoke about the sewer connection fee, and this is fairly level estimate for fiscal 22. So the Toll Brothers fees are now drying up, and we have a few other developments that have fees that will be coming in, but we didn't lower it back down to what we had in prior years, which is around 200,000, because we we're waiting for these fees to help support the sewer enterprise. If there aren't any fees coming in, whether they be from developments that are the smaller developments that are in the sewer areas or from um, the one or two houses that are being brought on as uh, separate through privilege, privilege fees because they're already in a sewer area, and that's going to be problematic uh, for supporting of the sewer enterprise funds. So that's just, I wanted to acknowledge that we are keeping that estimate higher than I would like to see it, but based on the comments from the board of what you um, have been approving and what is in the uh, design uh, queue right now with planning and what's already been approved. Uh, the septage processing capital project was, which is currently ongoing, which I think it may be nearly done, Kevin or Sean could probably uh, specify on that, is supposed to help our septage revenue. Uh, it's supposed to make it more attractive for people to come in. So right now the septage disposal fees and the um, connection fees are the actual revenue and the fiscal 21 year to date are down there. So our septage disposal is lagging a little bit, but one of the main disposers didn't want to come to us anymore because the water was not being drawn out of their product. So they were paying more. Um, and we weren't, uh, we were charging by the actual tank load, not by the actual amount delivered. So the, the septage receiving facility should improve and should address that and should make us more um, attractive for lack of anything else. Uh, for septage uh, receiving. That being said, we you know we want a nice balance to keep our uh, bioorganisms happy for the treatment, so we don't have to use additional um, electricity for UV or chemicals. See, it does sound like I actually listen to Will when he makes these presentations. And you do. <laughs> what what really necessary information I have lost, but I have retained that we need to keep the bugs happy. Um, and seawater doesn't make the bugs happy. So the fiscal 20 rate uh, increase of 6% mitigated some of the debt retirements. But when I uh, brought that presentation before you, we took advantage of the retirement of debt. Unfortunately, that was not debt that was supported by the sewer enterprise uh, receipts. It was debt that was supported by a debt exclusion override and it was general fund tax levy money that came in. So we have a delta of $97,000 right out of the gate. That's a problem that we need to make up. We also have a $30,000 increase in indirect costs, and those are the costs that the enterprise fund reimburses the general fund. And that was made up of $6,000 in property insurance increases and $22,000 in um, elections of different types of health insurance by the employees in that um, enterprise. So it's, those costs are whatever is incurred, the actual cost is what is charged back. It isn't an estimate. Uh, we also have uh, a new agreement now in place with that particular with the collective bargaining unit and that's bringing in uh, approximately sixteen thousand dollars increase in salaries uh, the cost of living increase for that was 1.5 percent as well as there are step increases um, so we talked about this as the uh, sewer enterprise fund budget was coming through the process last fall and into the winter that it was going to need a rate increase to move forward but we always look at um, especially uh, uh, Chairman Mignani always asks us to make sure that we are investigate what expenses we could cut to close the Delta. The fiscal 22 department request for the sewer enterprise fund was reduced by the town administrator by $181,000. And we still have $147,000 to make up the difference. So there was a major reduction in their budget um, before it came forward for the board to consider as well as for the advisory committee and town meeting to consider. So what's on the capital plan? There's about $24 million on the capital plan, and that includes uh, the expansion of the uh, sewer system, a $12 million expansion, depending on how that plays out, whether it be through the regional agreement, whether it be, whether it be through um, 
additional capacity that we uh, are able to capture from the Cedar Point and the Oceanside INI projects. Where that is on the five-year capital plan may be a little bit uh, too aggressive. Right now it's in 2023. I don't think we'll be at that point in 2023, but maybe we will be. Um, and whether or not that cost is still reasonable at 12 million and how much of that would be recovered through betterments is something is yet to be discussed. So that's something that you just need to be aware of in the capital plan, as well as other INI projects. Um, another, uh, the chain pond area for 4.2 million would be the next one after Oceanside that's been identified as one of the main sources of INI. And as Will comes forward um, with Kevin and Sean later on to discuss uh, the studies that come out of Cedar Point and the actual uh, recovery that's occurred there, that will give a better feel for what is going to happen in these other INI projects, I think. So um, what's authorized right now for the sewer enterprise fund for debt? So at the April town meeting, we authorized 4.9 million for the Oceanside area, which is a major INI project, probably a relining because that's a force main. Uh, we also authorized 660,000 for a sewer facility study. And that looks at not only the wastewater treatment plant, but the, um, the overall system, including pump stations. So out of that study, we should expect to see more capital projects that are going to be come onto the plan. Uh, we also have 3.2 million for Cedar Point. I'm not incorporating that because that uh, in, in any of our rate projections, because that's supported by betterments. Uh, and then we have a authorization that's still on the books from 2014 for design of sewer expansion. So once we have capacity, uh, whether it be through a regional agreement or whether it be through these II projects, we have already have an authorization to start moving forward with the design. So that's good news. And we're not incorporating that in our rates because as you can see, it's been on the books for seven years and we haven't uh, borrowed it yet because we haven't been in a position to move forward with the expansion. So there is retiring debt in the sewer, sewer enterprise fund, which is more helpful for sliding additional capital projects in. What we have to look at is the uh, facility study and the 4.9. So what is that going to cost us? It's about $528,000 in new debt service. Uh, and uh, excuse me, it's about $574,000 in new debt service and we have about 529,000 that's retiring. So it's sitting in well. Um, and then just because it's easier to see it in a graphical sense, that's going to fill this gap right here. We have a lot of debt service that falls off between 2024 to 2025. So that's when we want to issue that INI project in that gap. And that will help us from rate shock in that area. So even though it feels like we're going through rate shock and we've been going through rate shock, um, to Chairman, ben, uh, excuse me, to uh, select, select board member Benyani's earlier point, there were years when we did nothing and now uh, we're making up for that. And yes, for some reason, these particular slides, hot pink seem to work really well. <laughs> I don't know why, but it, it just works better on the pale blue. And I thought it would keep you awake at this time of the night. So we talked about the septage receding upgrades and the sewer, um, point, uh, sewer line replacement helping with operational costs. Both of these projects should help with costs when it comes to um, chemical usage and electricity, but that the proof will be in the pudding when we get there. Uh, so we don't have anything to hang our hat on yet, but that is an anticipated cost saving to come out of those two projects. We want to keep the sewer enterprise fund self-supporting. We finally get to that point. We want to keep it that way. And that means that the recurring revenues that it generates every year is what supports uh, its expenses. It's not the one-time revenues that come in. Uh, and we would like to avoid using retained earnings for the operational budget and save those retained earnings for the one-time costs, such as additional capital improvements so we don't have to borrow or the uh, less expensive capital improvements rather than um, financing. And again, we talked about continuing the one-off connections as a revenue source, potentially, depending on how it impacts the overall um, ability for the, the system to be expanded for the next phase. So what have we done for sewer rate increases over the last few years? Not, uh, it's not as busy a slide as the water rate, uh, the water enterprise fund happily. Uh, we did reduce the free usage over uh, two different rate cycles. And then we increased 6% last year. What we're looking at this year is being recommended to you at this particular meeting is a 9% increase from 5.24 to 5.71. And the base rate would increase from 65.40 to 71.29. 
Uh, this would cover the costs that we talked about earlier in the presentation for the uh, loss of the general fund revenue for the debt service, as well as the increase in insurance costs. So what would that do to our bill? Again, uh, the reason why you have a lot of blanks on this particular slide is those communities don't have sewer, but we wanted to use the same communities you saw in the water presentation in the sewer presentation, just so that you don't question why are some of them missing. So this would make us, um, we're currently the fourth with a um, 7,500 cubic feet annual usage. Uh, as a comparison, we would remain the fourth. Uh, our bill would estimated to go from an average bill from 655 to 713 if a 9% increase were to be brought into the picture. So that is the end of the presentation. And now I will return it to the board for their discussion boards. All right, who has any questions? I'm sure someone has. Hmm, very quiet. It's not because I stunned you into <laughs> sewer joy, I'm sure. And it's, it's not even that late. So um, we, we don't have that as an excuse. Um, yeah, Mr. Goodrich. Well, I, I didn't know Hanover didn't have sewer. That's interesting. Um, but second of all, for the, um, uh, maybe this is a question for Kevin. The, the 12 million, this add to collection system for phased expansion, is that is that part of um, um, I guess what is that if, if you kind of explain? And then do we have some sort of a of a of a price? Um, I know that's probably part of that study for uh, for this like the sewer facility, either upgrades or or new facility if things kind of fall apart with our, our good, our good neighbors. Um, I don't know when there is a timeline for us to have some sort of a ballpark of what that number may be if we had to go in a different direction, or is it that 12 million? Sorry, I rambled. So I believe the 12 million was allocated towards doing design and plans in, in everything on that section. Um, the, we're also having a Study, I believe next fiscal facility study for the entire plant. I know we've got a lot of precast concrete that's in bad shape down there and corroding. Um, and we will have, did that answer your question or what you were asking for? Um, I mean, I guess broadly, what, what I still would love to know is if, if there's no, if we had to do it ourselves, how do we get enough capacity to sewer North Citroen? Is it a whole new plant? Is it no way? Is it just I and I? Do all the I and I would get there? What's do we not know? Do we have a? I mean, I'd well, love to I, know. I, it's going to cost us forty million. Okay, now we have a number. I I could say we'd know, but we we won't know until we see the fruits of the labors from the Cedar Point project. We're looking at it daily now, but it's not like we've got a counter. We're doing. The monthly numbers and seeing how it's going over the past couple of years and seeing how far down we're going. Um, that combined with doing some of the other areas that are being identified in the INI study that we have going on now, um, we're hoping that we can get, you know, keep draining that amount or at least identify the projects that we need so that we can do North Situate if, if it fails in the other direction. Um, when we go out for the engineer, Engineering, when we know which direction we want to go in, one of the options we could do is we could look for a plant for somewhere in North Situate, um, you know, like a, a million gallon per day or half a million gallon per day plant. Um, but that would all be done through an RFP and through an engineering service. And we're not ready to do that because we're not 100% sure what direction we're going in. And we got to remove that I and I to, to go forward with the project. If, if that makes sense, we don't want to yeah, jump no, down I mean, on it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, if you can do the bulk of everything through the I and I, I mean, obviously I would just, I would love to, I know it's, you can't rush it because we have to wait for the storms, everything else, but I mean, it would be great to accelerate those I and I projects or, okay, that's all. I, I'm just, just trying to see, see where we were. So that, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no, we'd love to accelerate it too, but we don't want to jump the gun and all of a sudden being, you know, non-confirmate, you know, um, 
problems with our DEP permit that now we're way over and can't handle it either. We want to make sure we're we're fully safe. Yep. Yep. So we're we are conservative on it. Makes sense. Mr. Bignani? Yeah, just uh, one comment um, on the study that we've got planned for almost seven hundred thousand dollars. I don't know how we can proceed with that right now until we find out what we're going to be doing with with um, Paul. You know, because that changes the whole landscape of what the town sewer system looks like. And it's such a huge amount of money. And it seems like we do these feasibility studies every decade. Um, so I don't know if we can kind of hold off on that until we see what the INI, INI impacts are of Cedar Point and of Oceanside. To Andrew's point, if that gets us enough capacity, then we can at least do the maybe commercial part of um, North Situate. Um, through our own system. But if we do get the hull wreck, uh, the, the, the wheeling of the stuff to the hull, that changes everything. You know, we can do a lot of more situate. Um, and I don't think we need a study that could be up, you know, become obsolete on the shelf while we're working on the next five years on that project. So that's my thoughts. So if I can address that, Tony, you were talking, you were in and out a little bit. My connection hasn't been great. That's the facility study that you were saying to hold off on. Yeah. Um, Will is on vacation. Otherwise, he would he would be here um, doing backflips. <laughs> Regardless, to handle the waste that we have, we do have to do the facility study. We've got some structural issues that are potentially going on there with some of our precast concrete. I know you've toured the place multiple times. But when you look at the walkways and the overhangs and everything else, you can see a lot of that structural concrete and structural steels corroding. Um, and that's just due to time and age. So maybe it's not the full $700,000 that the study would be. I don't think it would be that much. But um, I don't want to speak too much for Will, but that's that's what has to be addressed. And that's needs, you know, that's the needs to keep the plant up and going in the future. It'll give us a, a ballpark of what we have to do. So, so that study is just to look at our current plant and tell us what we need to repair at our plant? It is, and I, I, I believe it is, and I'd have to look at the um, sheet that Nancy had. I, had okay. I lost a little bit of that presentation. Yeah, so, and I don't want to go over it tonight because I know it's only 9.15, but a couple of those presentations clog up your brain. Um, but I do want to get, that's something I'd want to know. You know, I, I think uh, I just hate paying somebody seven hundred thousand dollars to tell us to fix the thing that we know will not will already knows we can fix. Um, so. Well, you know, I, I kind of had the same feelings in the first place, and Will's the one that's been pushing it that we need some in-depth evaluation of some of the structural concrete and other um, plans in there. So, you know, I don't want to talk for him on this, but he's the one that's really been pushing hard for it. The facilities plan because Nancy and I have each had the discussions with them. Do you really need it, or could you just evaluate sections of the plant at a time instead of doing it all at once? Nancy, did I miss anything in that presentation, or is is that's a seven hundred thousand dollars that we're talking about? I was just pulling up the capital plan, um, and it states that the um, the complete facilities plan will provide the planning and direction needed to navigate and address issues around compliance with current and future pending permits, restore capacity to the existing plant, and how to best manage future capital projects to optimize costs and benefits for expanding and upgrading the plant for future flows and requirements. So it sounds like it's something that will be useful as a forecast tool, as well as dealing with the current issues that you just highlighted. Sounds like a consultant wrote that. Well, you know, and that's, we would, we put the RFP together. The RFP hasn't been put together and, and we'd advertise for it and see where it goes. All right, that's, that's just my two cents. So those are just budget numbers. Yeah. So, yeah. so it sounds like we need a further, more oh. a thorough explanation of what that um, <coughs> spent for, what we would get for that money. And I can um, supply that to Lorraine for the board from the capital plan. Is a, a fairly detailed, because everything that, Will puts on the capital plan, I then have to um, edit down. Oh, okay. or it wouldn't fit in one binder. Got it. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions? No? All right. 
I think we all agreed we're not going to vote these tonight because we have another meeting before, especially the sewer has to be um, voted. Anybody want to add anything else? No? Very good. All right. No, just, just thank you for yes. all the detail again. Nancy and Sean and Kevin and Will. Good stuff. Pleasure. Very Sean, powerful. Sean and Kevin, both Sean's. <laughs> yes. Well, thank all, you very much for time. listening. All right. Okay. Um, next, say, before we move on. Yes. Could I ask that? I mean, the 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 backup data is is wonderful on all of these. I'm wondering if we can um, consolidate these and make them available to the public because I really do think that people will appreciate knowing that you know when we make these decisions, it's based on a very detailed analysis. Um, maybe not as detailed as this, but if, I don't know if we can, um, I don't know, consolidate this to make it a little more user-friendly. If, so, if it pleases the board, I will put something together and bring it back to you with your next, um, for your next meeting. If you like it, that's what we'll put up on the website. I, I would recommend that we, you, I mean, this detail is great. If you wanted to consolidate and I would recommend that the board just authorize Mr. Bedreau to approve it you know, not wait two more weeks if we don't have to. Does anyone have any objection to that? Well, I mean, all of this is public record. I just think that we can pith, make it more pithy. Do you mean for the public, like a one, a one yeah, pager? Yeah, I mean, this yeah. is really, really great analysis. And it explains, you know, when, when they get that bill that says, okay, now you're paying 9% more, why? You know, I don't know. I just, well, I just well, need my, to be great Oh, go ahead, Karen. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, my only question would be when when this type of information is posted, I would like it to be clear that these are only proposals and that this is not what is going to happen. Um, so right, that's true. That's a very good point. It's to be prepared for release after we vote. That's what, yeah, especially because the increases won't be taking place yep. some, right immediately. So that if if we can then explain to people once we voted what the backup information that we used was, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Welcome, former Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> anybody else? No, do I see anyone from the audience? I don't see any hands up. All right, if everyone's fine, we'll move on to new business. Everyone good. Um, first, we are to discuss vote a one day wine and malt license for Ellen McKenzie at Situate the Maritime Center on 618 from 6 to 10 p.m. for a private event. So moved. Second. All in favor? We gotta do a roll call. Uh, let me, let me call do the I'll do the second one first also. Move the board of select to approve a one-day one and malt license for private events for Michael Apria for an event at Situate Maritime Center on June 19th, 2021 from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m. Thank you. Do I see a second? Second by Ms. Curran. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Ms. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, item of business is discuss vote situate recreation, municipal employee disclosures. Maura Glancy, uh, Re recreation director. I'm not sure that she's here, nor does she need to be. Um, there's a pages and pages and pages of forms that get filled out by people who work for the town. It seems to me in a lot of cases, teachers who uh, work for the recreation department in the summer. Did I get that correct? Yes. All right. Does anyone have any questions about the pages and pages and pages of disclosure? No. All right. Uh, would someone like to? I think we have to read the names. Would that be correct? Who would like to read the names? Oh, that's my job. Oh, okay, Andrew. That's a motion, so not necessarily, Andrew. Well, I'll do but it. go for it. Yeah, I'll do it anyway. Uh, before doing it, though, I want to just. Uh, 
up front apologize to anyone's name that I mispronounce. It's my own ignorance. And I'm very sorry if I mispronounce anyone's name, no ill intent. So motion, move that the board, the select board as required by Mass General Laws 268A have reviewed the disclosure forms from the following municipal employees who seek to provide personnel services to situate recreation. The exemption under section uh, 20B is approved for the following municipal employees. Andy Barlow, uh, Central Valley School teacher, Summer Recreation Program Director. Amanda, Amanda Kent. Kent. Amanda Kent, do you get her? Sorry. No. What? Um, Amanda Kent, SPS teacher, Summer Recreation Employee. Craig Parkins, SPS teacher, Summer Recreation Program Director. David Jordan, SPS coach, Summer Recreation Employee. Ellen Burke, SPS teacher, recreation indoor cycling instructor. Aaron Colbert, SPS teacher, recreation indoor cycling instructor. Elizabeth Dorgan, SPS teacher, assistant lifeguard director. Jonathan Schindler, SPS teacher, summer recreation employee. Kathleen McCarthy, SPS teacher, summer recreation program director. Lisa Howell, SPS substitute teacher, recreation instructor. Uh, Matthew Poirier, SPS teacher, summer recreation program director. Megan Bard, SPS teacher, summer recreation program director. Molly Scolacito, sorry. SPS teacher, summer recreation program director. Paul Papadonis, SPS substitute teacher, recreation program director. Sarah Stewart, SPS teacher, recreation employee. And Tyler Myers, SPS teacher, summer recreation program director. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Bagnani. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Karen. Yes. Mr. Bagnani. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is discuss vote board and committee appointments. We have election workers that we need to um, appoint. Does someone have a motion? So we first have that health board. Do you want what? It's the health board, the next one. Do you want the board of health first, Karen? Uh, well, I actually have on my agenda election workers first, but it doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. Do you want me to do board of health first? I will. All right, why don't sure. I do board of health first? So um, I think we all know, or uh, we were informed early in um, May that Wendy Olsiak, sorry about that name, um, has re resigned from the Board of Health, which created another opening. Um, Lorraine, at my request, contacted Kelly Murphy Roach, who was one of the final applicants for the position uh, at the last um, time we appointed someone to the Board of Health. Uh, she agreed that she was still interested and so we're here tonight to decide whether or not we want to appoint her. Would you like a motion? Please. Move to appoint Kelly Murphy Roche to the Board of Health for a term of three years until successor is named and completion of the Conflict of Interest Law online training program is completed within 30 days. Do second. I hear a second? Second by Ms. Canfield. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Now Madam Chair, may I, may I, may I just yes. uh, ask a question to the board? Of course. Uh, with regards to the Board of Health. Um, yeah. So it's a small board. It's three individuals, which makes it tough, right? To um, any board that's three people is very tough with quorums and things like that. Um, so I don't know if we want to just uh, contemplate and think about in the next couple of months, I think we would, it would have to be done at town meeting at a minimum, right, to consider making that board a five person board to make it a little bit stronger. Um, so I just wanted to raise it now as the issue is up for us to think about in the future as we move forward. I, I agree with you. Because frankly, if you only have two because one has resigned and you haven't appointed to a new one or someone is appointed, if you have a tie vote, I believe that results in a no vote. Is that right, Jim? Yes. Okay. Yep. So it, yeah. I think it would behoove us to do that, but maybe we'll take that up as 
part of charter review or would that just be bylaws? Bylaws. Bylaws. Okay. I think bylaw. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll put that on our list Town of meeting. Do. <laughs> Town meeting. All right. Um, we do have to appoint um, election workers. And I know there is a motion and these are supplied by, I think, Kathy Gardner's office. Correct. Okay. So uh, do we need to read the names, Lorraine? You could say as listed. Okay. So who would like, like to make the motion unless anyone's got any questions? Yes. Move to appoint the following election workers from the town clerk's supplemental list as provided in our backup information. Okay, very I good. Second. second. Second by Mr. Bagnani. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes, and thank you to these people that do it year after year. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Yes, and I will say the town clerk has been busy, 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 busy <laughs> the past few years. She needs a vacation. And now we've got a re-precinct and so at any rate, never stops. Um, now, acceptance of minutes, or I'll do that at the end, liaison reports. I will start by saying I attended the Plymouth County Board of <laughs> Advisory Board. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this past week. And uh, all I can tell you is they did approve the budget and um, but I will say that there, there was a lot of time spent on the Plymouth County CARES Act uh, disbursements and Situate has reached its max, right, Nancy? Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know if we still got any out that are uh, yet to be approved, but okay. But I think what they were talking about there, and they were congratulating Situate for, for being so on the, on the, on the money. Um, but I think it means that that what they've got in the queue, including what they've got left for us, we're still under the cap that we have. But we were only one of, I think, three or four towns that uh, were that efficient. So, um, and a lot of talk, uh, a lot of the rest of the meeting was spent talking about ARPA, which is the, uh, the CARES Act, as it was described on steroids. Um, <laughs> I, th I think Nancy and Jim are probably a, m a lot more on top of it than I would have been, but essentially there are 24 different programs that are eligible for this money. And depending on, uh, you know, some of it's just for vaccines, some of it's for uh, revenue replacement. I won't bore anyone with all the various uh, tranches, but they seem to be most interested in the uh, water sewer broadband and air filtration types of grants that might be available in either, I think was the second or third tranche of the, uh, the money. But, um, you know, I think we would all agree that they did an excellent job at uh, making the process simple. I, you hear talk that the state government has been less than uh, efficient in terms of giving out the CARES money. So uh, I was appreciative and the, the meeting, they wanted to get it over with, so I didn't thank them in public, but I think we've thanked them a lot. So, um, so that's what if I did. I can just uh, interject. The, the issue with the with the opera fund, so called, is the county has gotten over a hundred million dollars in opera funds that are, in a sense, labeled for cities and towns. Uh, what, I think it's three million dollars for for situate Nance, right around three million dollars. Um, and there's really nothing in the in opera that says they're supposed to administer those. Our position has been, give us our money. We want our $3 million. We'll decide how we're going to spend it. Uh, we shouldn't have to go through a process like we do with the CARES Act. It's a different program. It's different funding. And it's our money. Uh, and I know that the county is, is discussing whether they should administer it again like the CARES Act. And, and really, we're, we're against that. Um, we've been pushing them. I know Pat O'Connor, the senator, has has been supporting us. That you know, um, county government does good things in Massachusetts, but county government in Massachusetts isn't county government all over the country. Right. And when the federal government gives the money out, they're looking at county government in Indiana that runs the police and runs fire services and runs all this stuff. And so the county get all this money. And towns and sorry, 
parts of the state without county, that money is going directly to the municipalities. So, you know, really the, the argument we're having right now at the county is we want our money. Just give us our money and we'll spend it. Uh, but we'll see what they end up doing. Uh, I, have we, have I think, we written an official letter on behalf of the board to them stating uh, as such? They haven't had an official discussion about it. Uh, we mm -hmm. can. Um, I think if, uh, if I make Nancy go through another uh, CARES Act type of reimbursement process, um, I won't be able to go in the office over there anymore. It'll, it'll just be a, a bad place. We, we can. I mean, I made my, my position for the town, I think, very clear with the treasurer, with two of the three members of the board. I know Senator O'Connor, all the towns around here agree 100% with what we're talking about. It's our money. Give it to us. Uh, and let us deal with it. Don't make us jump through hoops to get it back. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Any other liaison reports? I have some. Okay, Maura. So DEI, I will just give you an update. As you know, they're scheduling meetings with all the departments to go through and sort of just give you an idea of the four sort of topics and working groups that their they're issues that they're going to cover with each of the departments are, you know, talking about employee um, recruiting and training, you know, are we administering and doing um, fostering equitable service throughout town, again, talking uh, to them more about the hiring process, you know, retention and also expansion, and obviously all with with the lens of equity inclusion, right? And how can we, we improve and expand and then also procurement policies. So um, just thought I'd share that with you. All the department heads are very well aware of what's coming. Bob Clark's been a terrific liaison in helping all the volunteers navigate through the different departments. So um, they've been great. So they're moving along and I think they're gonna come before us, I think sometime in July, just to give us another quarterly update um, as to where they are. Um, so they're making good progress. Um, and then just lastly, I, it's not really a liaison report, but I would love to just publicly acknowledge the um, five Eagle Scouts that were awarded their um, Eagle Scout uh, pins this uh, weekend. It was a lovely service. It was outdoors. Um, Nico is the uh, troop leader and just did a really wonderful job you know, these five young men did different projects around town from building um, a handicap accessible ramp over at Ware Farm, fixing a gate at the Cudworth House, um, putting medallions all around town to highlight um, the importance of, um, of, of our water resources. So, um, um, and then another one was uh, doing trail maps over throughout the conservation land. So I just wanna honor Dimitri um, Afonsenko, which I'm sure I butchered that last name as always, um, Ryan Osiello, Cameron Rossini, Ryan Flynn, and Robbie Murdoch. And they were just fabulous young men and they should all be commended. They did a great job. And um, that troop is amazing. So congratulations to all of them. And that's it. Thank you, Thank you Maura. Anyone else? Uh, Andrew, is that a hand up? No, Karen. Canfield? Yes, no? First, yes, first I'm applauding the Eagle Scouts. I mean, it's amazing how many this little town mm -hmm. turns out every year. And that's a great tribute to the program. Um, I wanted to just let the board know that um, we are trying to schedule a, a tour of our proposed agriculture farm um, aboard our brand new fire boat or fire, what is it, I don't know, whatever it's called, the fire, the pump boat, I don't know what it's called, but the new boat, the $435,000 boat that we have. Um, so that's coming, so watch your emails for that. Um, um, it's a beautiful time of year to go tour those things. Um, I wanted to also give a shout out for two days, there were volunteers from the Beautification Garden, Community, Garden Club and the Situate Library Foundation who went out and weeded all of the gardens in front of the library. Um, and so a shout out to them. And um, that we, 
Um, I, and, I don't know, I have a whole long list. Um, we have an, our new intern for the Charter Review Commission started last week and is thoroughly regretting his choice, but is doing a great job. <laughs> so can you give us an update on who the interns are and what they're doing? I can give you an update on the Charter Review because that's under my watch and I think Jim can cover the other guy, uh, other interns. Um, Brett Bijot, who is also an Ego Scout. Um, has, I'm sorry, Karen, I didn't get his name, Brett. Brett Bijou, B-I-J-O-U, I think. Um, I met him originally many years ago when he was an Eagle Scout and he is now a rising senior at Bryant and is tasked with doing basically paralegal work for the Charter Review Committee for the summer. So awesome. Um, we'll be meeting on Monday and he'll be introduced to the board there. Jim, do you want to, I know there's another fellow. Yeah, I don't want to, um identify him at this point because we're still waiting for him to confirm the internship. Uh, but uh, one of them, uh, we get one, his task is going to be to work with uh, Becky Malmut and the Water Commission and the Water Department and Kevin to stop putting in place uh, the offset program, the water offset program that we talked about and get that set up and kind of take all the information that water resources have put together and, and everything and kind of uh, synthesize that down and come up with a draft proposal for the town. That's going to be a big project, but it's uh, something I think they can really dig their, uh, dig their teeth into. But we're still waiting for them to confirm that they're going to actually take the internship. So I don't want to out them until I, I hear back. Great. So do we have two or three? I know we have two confirmed. We had a third that was, uh, sorry, one confirmed, one that's close, and the other one we haven't been able to get hold of. We were looking at three. Um, the third one, we have some miscellaneous stuff in the office, including the parking down at <coughs> Cole Parkway, which is a project Brad was working on to get that straightened out, um, and uh, some others, just some stuff around the office that we're trying to get cleared up. But uh, the water resource one came up today in our meeting. We said, hey, that sounds like a perfect job for an intern to, to really focus on for the summer. So uh, that's what we'll take the first one, and we'll task them with that. All right. The yeah. last thing I have is that the Council on Aging is holding their first in-person meeting at the new Senior Center on um, June 10th at 5.30, which is very exciting. Good for them. And they'll all find out that I'm not six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, in closing, unless there's anything else anyone wants to say, um, there will be a celebration of life for Joe Norton this Sunday, uh, June 13th, from 2 to 5 p.m. at the Barker Tavern. Uh, the family invites family and friends to this event, and I'm sure if all of his family and friends come out, there'll be a line out the door. Um, so uh, I know that a number of select board members and former members plan on being there, and but we want to wish the family well and give him this tribute, and we do have a proclamation from the Board of Selectmen and the town uh, to read at the event. All right, so with that, why don't we um, approve the meeting minutes of, does anyone have the date? I'm on a different screen. May 20th. Move to accept the meeting minutes for the select board meeting held on May 25th, 2021. Thank second. You. Second, second by Ms. Canfield. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Conley. Yes. Ms. Canfield. Yes. Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Ms. Curran. Yes. Mr. Vignani. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Ms. Canfield. <laughs> Second by Ms. Curran. Uh, Ms. Curran. Uh, roll call vote, please. Sure. Who, who made the motion? I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Canfield. OK, thank you. Second uh, by Ms. At 945. At 945. <laughs> I see that. I, I thought it was a typing error on my own part. <laughs> Haven't I seen that it was in a year. 11, 1145. Huh. <laughs> Wait, I got to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Conley. Yes. Miss Canfield. Uh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Goodrich. Yes. Miss Curran. <laughs> yes. Mr. Vignani. Oh, yeah. And we reviewed all the DPW rates. <laughs>
Motion carries 5-0. Um, I would like to remind everyone that docu documents need to be signed tomorrow, in particular the proclamation. So I would ask you to, you know, please be sure to get into town hall tomorrow.